Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Americ Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, stereotyped, or just told as part of getting older? You just go to AmericHealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them, which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventative medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. 1D's real world experience is what I would consider and they consider battle tested. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. What's going on guys? We are back with another episode of Table Talk. Today's guest, or today, my guest, see, I even screw up, I screw something up with the intro every single time. It's a, it's a trademark thing now, so nobody else can do it, or they're ripping me off. My guest today is Kevin Cam. We have um, a bunch of topics to get into. Uh, I want to get into uh, your background with Chico, and then with Conjugate. You know, it's I, just last week when I had um, Daniel DeBrock on, we talked a little bit about similarities between Chico and Conjugate and some of the differences. And one of the conclusions or one of the things that I've always said is most of it's similar, but most people focus on the differences because that's just kind of the nature of the industry that we're in. So I want to talk about that. Uh, you have an interesting hierarchy here as far as greatness goes that I want to get into that. I want to get into some of the way that you're rotating max effort exercises, how you got into strength and conditioning, you're still competing as well. So you're a practitioner of what you're actually coaching the coaching. There's a lot of stuff. Um, so I guess to start with what's, what's your story? Like, how do you, how do we want to lead into this? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, so I actually, I played soccer as a kid. Um, competitively, it's all I wanted to do was play soccer. Um, so I ended up, I was recruited to a bunch of division one schools. And, but I wanted to play, so I ended up finding a Division two school to go to, and then all of a sudden you got to pick a major. And it's like, fuck, I don't know what I want to do, but uh, I like sports. So I got into the exercise science thing, so my undergraduate degree is actually health and wellness. 
Um, and then later on, I ended up getting a master's degree in kinesiology at the same time. Um, but it's just kind of something like sports has just been part of my life from day one. So it was just something I kind of fell into more than anything else. Um, I think the field was relatively new when I started to get into it, like in college and stuff. There weren't a lot of schools that offered exercise science, um, which now I think it's a lot more prevalent than it was before. What year was that? Just for some kind of I graduated from high school in 2001. So this okay. would have been 2001, 2002. Okay. Um, and I don't know, like sports, like sometimes I think s certain things just pick you, right? Mm -hmm. So like I, I, I just, I loved sports and in hindsight, I mean, the ROI on getting a master's degree in a field where you could just get a weekend, like I think Alan Cosgrove got his mm -hmm. dog a fucking certification, yeah. like for personal training, like, um, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but at the same time, it's just like, it's something I'm passionate about and I did really well in school. And if I had done a different major, I don't know if I would have done as well in school. So it was just something that, um, you know, I just, I love sports. And I think the mm -hmm. cool thing about like powerlifting is anybody can do it. Right. I actually say this to my lifters a lot. Uh, you know, the best part of powerlifting is your grandmother can do it. But the worst part of powerlifting is also your yeah. your grandmother can do it at the same time. But like it can give you a lot of there's just a lot of life skills you can learn from playing sports that I don't think you can get nowadays. Like I, I think life's become so easy that we try to make adversity out of stuff that just doesn't necessarily exist. Um, and you can have that adversity yourself underneath a barbell in a sport that it's about you. Like I know everybody wants to compare themselves to each other on uh on the internet and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about you. It's about you being better than you were yesterday um, and learning a lot about yourself throughout the process. Like there's just, I think there's just something you don't know about yourself until you get a little fucked up and then you have to show up at the gym and continue to try to like press mm -hmm. on and stuff like that. I think there's, there's just a, a lot of life skills that go into that. But like in terms of like powerlifting, so after college soccer, um, I had this gap of not playing sports. I, I got into some trouble and stuff. So then I was like, man, you know, I gotta get my life back in order. And that's actually when I went back to school, I ended up getting my master's degree. And I did mixed martial arts for the next 10 or so years. So at the time when, so it had been about, I was, how old was I at the time? So 32, so this is now about seven, eight years ago. Um, I was just kind of like training three days a week with my friends. We were just kind of like beating the shit out of each other in the morning and stuff and then going to work. They were having families moving away, getting houses. And I was working at a gym that had like a big powerlifting um, focus. Mm -hmm. So I was like, God, oh, this sounds cool. One of, one of the guys um, was just like busting my balls. I was like, come over here and deadlift this or whatever. And it was like 420 on the bar. I didn't even warm up. I mm -hmm. just went over to it like straight leg, round back, just like snapped that shit up. And I was like, you know what? fuck this, I'm going to sign up for a meet. So I actually signed up for a meet before I even put a bar on my back. Um, ended up doing that meet. I met Shaco right before that meet. Yeah, the summer of that same year of my first meet. Mm -hmm. So like we were having conversations back and forth and like some of it just made a lot of sense to me. Um, so I ended up hiring him as my coach going into my first meet. And then for the next three years I worked with him and then I started like building. Um, my own powerlifting team. What What about the first meet attracted you to stay in the sport? Because a lot of people compete, yeah. but never compete again. The most people. That's a good point. Um, I don't know. It was just fun. And I think like in the beginning, like for any sport, you got to have fun in the beginning mm -hmm. to stick with it, right? So like all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was squat 315 pounds. So at the time I weighed... When I started lifting, I weighed like 170. I think at this meet, I was like 180, 190, something like that. And all I wanted to do was squat three plates. Um, so first squat I took, I want to say it was like 275. It was a mile fucking high. Mm -hmm. But then I, you just throw the, the next jump on it anyways because it's your first meet. Um, but like it didn't even matter that I missed that lift. And then I, I hit the 315 squat and whatever for bench. I think it was like 270 or something. Mm -hmm. And then a mid fours deadlift. So like my numbers, like I think Greg Panora competed at this meet, like Ben Puccio, like there were some like really, like I didn't fucking care. It's just having fun doing yeah. my own thing, like um, with my friends, with the people I worked with. So I think that aspect just kind of like drew me to the sport in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, yeah, I think I signed up for another one, like very shortly mm -hmm. after. And I did my second one in April and then I've been competing ever since, but um you know, in the fun 
part goes away the same way. Like when you're a beginner and things are new, like I think when you start getting into like the deeper things, right, that fun starts it. And then you get those like deeper things that I could, as a person, it just kind of reminded me a lot being a kid playing soccer or, you know, post-college doing the mixed martial arts stuff. And then, you know, being able to do it with powerlifting, a sport that could probably, hopefully, if I don't fuck myself up too bad or be too stupid, mm -hmm. do like later on into life, like continue to do it. Like, like what you do, like, yeah. you know, seeing you do SSB box squats in here, mm -hmm. like max effort stuff like that. That's cool to me. And like, that's what I want to be able to do um, moving forward. But I think it's helped me as an adult, like teach me some lessons. Like, um, what would you say is one of the biggest ones? Oh man. I think in terms of like, I think how objective the sport is, right? I think it's very easy for us to kind of bullshit ourselves in other sports. I think mixed martial arts was like this too. If you're getting beat up, you're getting beat up. Mm -hmm. But I even think there are times where you could be like, oh, well, if I did this differently or if I, you know, I, I was able to get my shots in or like with a team sport, you can always be like, well, these people aren't pulling their weight type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, I feel like with this sport, it's so objective, like whether you're making progress or not. That like it really makes you stop and like question everything that like you're kind of doing in that in that moment like for yourself it's easy to sit here and coach somebody and be like hey mm -hmm. you're doing this wrong but to do it to yourself and actually sit there and be like hey um you need to take a step back like these things that you believe it's not working mm -hmm. right and like i think at the same time too like in terms of i've said this on like my podcast with other mm -hmm. people like i, I think when you know there's certain people might get addicted to like drugs and alcohol as they're having some like tough life circumstances for me like violence and anger were my thing so mm -hmm. like i always was getting pissed off all the time and like the thing is is when you're not hitting when you're out here and you're not making the progress you want to make like you're gonna get pissed off but guess what it's not gonna fucking help yeah it's literally just gonna keep going backwards and backwards mm -hmm. and backwards until you learn to learn to chill out um and like the more i learned like later on like your subconscious just writes this autobiography, right? So, and you're not even aware of it. So if you think that you're just some low level piece of shit your entire life, that's going to come out underneath that bar. And at some point you're going to have to address those things to be like, Hey, how, how can I rewrite this script that I've already written about myself to then move forward and be a better version of me tomorrow? And like, I think a lot of it is, it's more character building than it is you know, strength building. I think in a lot of times you just, you sit there in those thoughts, just sit in the back of your head and it does, I think it limits people. And I think at the end of the day, I don't think anybody can't qualify for the Arnold or can't make nationals and be competitive. Like not everybody's going to be a world record holder, but there's no reason why everybody can't be in that, that top 10% if they, they just kind of, you know, deal with that stuff. And I'm going to ramble here, but I tell everybody there's like a, there's a start line and there's a finish line. Right. And that finish line is the same for everybody. But some people based off of genetics, they take a step forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been lifting longer. So they've they're already taking a few steps forward, you know, and maybe you got some issues you got to deal with. And, you know, you're just in line to get to that starting line. But that finish line is still there and it's still achievable. You just got to work a little bit harder, be a little bit smarter, be more technical, you know, maybe try something, you know, hop into single ply gear when no, where nobody mm -hmm. is like, you know, I, I think gear in general i think it's just a good genetic equalizer at times too but like um you just gotta work a little bit harder and you just gotta dig down deep and figure yourself out a little bit more and i think once people start realizing like once they stop comparing themselves like at the end of the day we're fucking exercising like mm -hmm. we're literally being graded on how well we squat bench or deadlift right like when you take that away and you just start putting in these other pieces of like hey this is who i am now and this is where I'm going. And now, you know, you fast forward. It's like, this is who I am now. This is where I'm going. And you see that progress that you make over time. Like, I mean, that gift is way better than a five pound PR, you know? Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the five pound <clears throat> PR, I've kind of always looked at that as a PR is a PR, right? And the, somebody said this to me when I was younger, because I, I started competing very young and it was, and you question, like I questioned a lot as I was coming up because every sticking point, you're like, oh shit, is this it? Like, and it takes a while before you can figure out that there is a way around all of this. Like there's always a way. You may not see it, but there's always a way. And somebody at a very young age said, do you believe that you can put five pounds, you know, on every one of your lifts? Just five pounds. 
I'm like, fuck, of course. It's like, well, then after that five pounds, can you put another five pounds on? You know, it's like, of, of course, you know, and then, and that, that all is a beginner and an intermediate that makes a whole lot of sense. And then as you get more advanced, the, the question, it's, it changes context because then it's, can you put five pounds on the lift? You're like, well, fuck, that means I got to get back to where I was first. And that's a big ask. But if I can get back to where I was, yes, I can. So you still can. It just, the framework of it changes. But, and it's funny because some people will say, dude, it's only five pounds. And you're like, you know what? It, there was a time it took me three years to put five pounds on one lift. That doesn't mean it wasn't, you weren't trying or, you know, all this other kind of stuff. It just doesn't work that way. But a beginner will look at that because they're just like rolling in the beginner gains. It's like, man, you sucked. You've only put five pounds on your <laughs> lift. And, you know, everybody's end, you know, as, as you described, it's going to be different. And you don't know what it is, but of course you you don't know what it is, but you can get a pretty good idea the longer you stay in it. You'll never know what it is if you don't stay in it. Then you're just, those are the people that sit back and say, well, I could have. You know, you couldn't have. Yeah, the woulda, shoulda, coulda. Yeah. Um, I, and it, you know, I think there's this, I shared this, I think it was a Simon Sinek video, however you say his last name. He does a lot of like business mm -hmm. stuff. And he talked about how everybody wants to be to get to the top of the mountain without actually climbing the mountain. Mm -hmm. Right. And they think it's just this like this straight path straight up that like, man, I'm just going to I'm going to get there. So like you get into these like these periods where it's like in the beginning, your squat might jump 40 pounds in six months. Right. Or then it's. You know, it's easy to put 10, 15 pounds on a lift. Like the, the beginner gains, it's not just six months. It's like two or three years, mm -hmm. right? It's like after that point, basically you have the beginner gains until you get fucked up. And then when you get fucked up, it's like what you're saying. It's like, well, if I can go back to where I was. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be okay with being who you are at that moment in time. And you got to be five pounds better than you were yesterday. Up until that point, you're back to where you were. And then worry about getting five more pounds. So I think no matter what, like you get this scenario where we're always looking so far ahead on the path instead of just like making sure we're putting our feet in solid ground today yeah. and we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And I think for a lot of people, and I, like one of the things that I try to like sit and think about is like, why do people only last in the sport three to five years? You know, if somebody's hit those beginner gains and they, they're done, I get it. You, you get sick of it. You go mm -hmm. on to something else, right? Um, the age people get into the sport, maybe they get into it in their 20s. So they get married, they have kids, they don't have the time to commit to it anymore. But at the same time, you can still find the time to like, if you really loved it, you'd, you'd find the time to do it, right? Um, but I think a lot of it is, is just, we look so far ahead and then it just, it's like, man, to get back to where I was before or to be as good as my hero on Instagram, I can't do that. The journey's it's so far away when you just, if you just back it up and it's just one step at a time, just one step at a time. And you're going to get to points in that path where it's like, fuck, this is a dead end. I got to turn around, go back down, come back up. And it's in those moments that like you get those lessons of the sport. That's when it's fun. Mm -hmm. That's when you learn about yourself. That's where you get the rewards of it. But if you just do it up until it gets hard and you quit and you just go on to something else, it's like you're always going to kind of be stuck in the same, in the same like character traits that you have as a, as a human. You're just... You're not going to know how to deal with stuff when you get stuck if you don't take a step back, think about it, and be okay with backtracking for a time, coming back up. Um, so I just – I think it's a sport that um, – I don't know. Maybe you have a better answer to this. Like well, once it started coming on to the in internet yeah. and stuff too, it must have changed a bit. No, it did. And um, the mountain thing, it's always been a curious thing for me because – by no stretch of the imagination to, am I ever a fucking mountain climber, but I climbed small <laughs> mountains, hills, you know, when I was a kid. And whenever I hear analogies like that, it, it's always interesting to me because you got to get there, right? Nobody's mountain is like right out their back door. Like you got to fucking get there. So some of them I've had to get to, you know, you had to fly, you had to drive. Sometimes it was a 20 minute boat ride. You know, it, it could be three or four hours. Now, from a distance, the mountain doesn't look that fucking big, 
right? You have perspective. Then as you get closer, a hill looks like a fucking mountain. But as you were saying, if you step back, in a way it is stepping back to actually see the whole thing before you get to it. Because if you just were blindfolded and stuck in front of a, a 15 foot hill, a drop, and you can't really see much over what that is, 15 by 30 foot, we go a little bit <laughs> higher, right? And for all you know, it could be fucking a thousand foot high. You don't know. But if you step back, take the context of it, be like, man, that's only fucking 15 foot. What do I need to know? And, and a lot of this is, from a conditioning standpoint, it's whatever your base of development is before you even started powerlifting. Yeah. So in the sport, a lot of people will make recommendations on how certain people should train as a beginner, but yet they don't know how their base is. Did they play soccer for many, many years beforehand? Did they not do jack shit? Because yeah. not all beginners are created the same, which is going to determine what tools they have before they start, you know, climbing. But from to answer your question about the contacts at the Internet, when I came out, my first meet, my first meets were... I didn't even know there were, there was really just the USPF at the time, which was the IPF affiliate. You know, since then there's been, I think it went from the USPF to the ADFPA to the USAPL to whatever the fuck it is now, you know, so it changes all the time. But there was just, I don't want to say there was just one, but to me there was just one. Maybe there was the AAU as well. And what you learned, you learned in the gym. There was no internet you know, or a magazine or something along those lines, then you had to find the the gyms that had the better lifters and go from there. But it was, nothing's changed. I mean, well, let me reframe that. The most important thing hasn't changed. The lifter and the bar. Yes, some of the bars have gotten a little bit better, but the lifter still approaches the bar essentially the same way I approached the bar when I was 12, 13 years old. It's the same thing. Um, some use a monolift, whereas some don't, you know, I had to walk it out back then, you know, as, as time the monolift came, but you're still essentially doing the squat and somebody's teaching you how to do the squat and they're teaching you how to, how to work, you know, and how to auto regulate, you know, your training that was probably taught more when I was coming up than it is today. You know, today things are, um, they're different in the standpoint that things are being, taught and described in many different ways and that's not a bad thing because people absorb content and cues and coaching in many different ways where then there might have been just one way like here's that meathead way and whatever it's going to be and very rarely was it challenged because the strongest guy in the gym was essentially the one that was making the rules um, because over a period of time i would see that being challenged and the internet did open the door for those things to start to be challenged that's a good thing. And I think that's a reason why training has gotten so much better and why the skill level has gotten so much better. Yes, more people are being exposed, but ideas were challenged instead of just being here's linear. That's all that is, you know, and then conjugate kind of came before kind of before the Internet in a way, but it was through Powerlifting USA that Louis was putting this stuff out and maybe there's hit training. Uh, Ken Leisner, you know, had his stuff and they would challenge each other kind of, but it's like you write an article and you're like, this is bullshit for this reason. <laughs> then you got to wait for him to read it. Right. So then that's that month. And then they're going to reply maybe that month, but usually a month later. So this all happened in like a fucking three month period of time, <laughs> which now happens within seconds, you know, in somebody's comment thread, which it's, in a way, it's the same, just more of it, you know, so it's, there's good and bad, you know, to, to both of those, which is, but it's still at the end of the day, the one thing I keep trying to let lifters know, and they just keep fucking seem to forgetting at the end of the day, it's the lifter and the bar. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always going to be. You know, it's, it's not going to change, but it can, that perspective can get so diluted, you know, with people, especially the longer they're in the sport, because they start to see more of the, um, the inner workings of what goes on behind the sport, which they really don't have a whole lot of fucking control over anyhow. Yeah. And like, I can attest to that. Cause like we were talking about my first meet, how I had fun. Cause I didn't know any better. I didn't mm -hmm. follow 
lifters on Instagram. I, I mean, I saw big lifts. I was at a gym where people were lifting huge weights, which I think is important earlier on too, because mm-hmm. you realize that there's a, your ceiling of expectations is a lot higher. Um, but yeah, once I started, like, I think we'll call it paying attention more to the kind of how the sausage is made, I guess it did. It, it like, there were periods where like, I got frustrated with it. Cause it's like, man, you know, this sucks. And like, you're kicking rocks and you're complaining about all the same shit that everybody's probably complained mm-hmm. about for fucking ever. Um, but I do think there's this like period where you just kind of get over it and you're like, yeah, I don't fucking care. Like we're just, yeah. we're just lifting weights. Like it is what it is. Whatever federation you want to compete in, whatever equipment you want to wear monolift, walk it out, whatever, like who cares? Like have fun with yeah. it, learn from it and move on. I think everybody moves through, it's like a bell shaped curve where, you know, before you start, you really don't know fucking anything. You just know you like to lift weights and then that's it. And then you start going up this curve, you acquire knowledge, gym bro knowledge, magazine knowledge, low hanging fr- internet fruit knowledge, you know, just the simple stuff. And then you, you know a little bit more than you knew when you knew nothing, right? But to you, you know way more than what it is. And then as you move up that bell curve, and I see, I see that, I've, I've been in this for a long fucking time. I see it all the time. I can almost spot where people are on the curve just by what they're doing, what they're saying, and how they're presenting themselves. You know, and some people will, they'll, they'll learn some exercise science terms or then after that it might be physical therapy terms and then biomechanic terms and then kinesiology terms and their words get bigger and then they they get up to like the top of the curve and they fucking know everything like everybody's an idiot they fucking know all of it right and they have the words to back it up and all this other stuff and then five years later they start going down the other side you know, then another five years later, they're back down here like, man, I don't know a fucking thing. <laughs> I just love lifting weights, man. But they and everybody goes through it. And anybody that says they don't are fucking lying. Anybody that says they didn't go through it is fucking lying. You know, everybody does. And it's just it's just part of that acquisition. You know, you're learning and you're learning like, fuck, this is awesome. I didn't know I could use this and you apply it and it works like fuck i'm god then you apply it to somebody else and then it works then after a while like fuck nothing works and you're like oh shit you know and then it's you get humbled i think because a lot of the things that you thought were working cease to or you start to realize this is really hard to figure out what really does and doesn't work it's just a big guess you know and but it's 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 interesting to watch you know where people are on that and now it's also interesting to watch the critics of the people that are on that, yeah. you know, because if they forget they were there too, right? And when they were there, now this is the weird part, because years ago when they were there, there was nobody there ripping their asshole about it, right? <laughs> so, but now we're getting to the point where those people that are there did get their asshole ripped about it. Right. So now they're kind of like, you know what, fuck you, they fucked me, it's my turn, you know? <laughs> to kind of do the same thing back with that and kind of move through there where you know as you're going up your bell curve the the shiko thing came in which i want to talk about that so you worked with him for a few years right um how would you in a simplified way explain the philosophy behind that and then we'll go a little bit more deeper with it all right so to simplify the way that like shiko worked so average volume, average intensity were the biggest things. Okay. So average volume in terms of number of lifts, average intensity by, so every rep at 50% of one RM up to hundred percent, that was included in the number of lifts. Mm-hmm. So the average intensity, let's say it's for somebody who's been lifting for a little while, it's going to be like 70% plus or minus 2%. And then he has these recommendations of number of lifts based off of their, it's basically, um, the classification chart. So if you're at X body weight, your total's here, there's gonna be a recommended number of lifts that he has for those, for those lifters. And average intensity will always stay the same. The number of lifts will have a little bit of um, ups and downs based off of whether it's a prep cycle or a comp cycle, but they'll always be within this given range. And then once you kind of figure out those, those numbers, you'll have each week. So he'll kind of do is, let's say we're doing a four week, a four mm-hmm. week block. 
So there'll be two weeks where there's going to be higher amounts of volume. So like a typical, let's just say like week one will have the second highest number of lifts. Week two will have the highest number of lifts. Week three will have the smallest. Week four might be like a, a lower, mm -hmm. right? So let's say it's got a typical like periodization curve um, like that. And then now to go each day. So you're going to have high stress weeks. You'll have high stress months also, but high stress weeks and lower stress, medium stress, whatever. And then when you get into your daily training, what you're going to get is you're going to get high, medium, and low stress training days. This is all based off of number of lifts. Mm -hmm. um, so your higher stress training days are going to be the ones that actually like drive adaptations. The medium ones will be to maintain it. So when you say number of lifts, is it all lifts for the session or just what does that refer to? Yeah, so all lifts of the comp lifts. So a typical like Shaco program might on day one, let's say it's like a higher stress day and it's going to be a squat bench day. Yeah. You might squat first, then bench, then go back to squats, and then you'd have two or three yeah. um, accessories. At so the, the accessories are not added in this at They're all. not added in. The accessories make up, it's almost the reverse of Louis. The yeah. accessories make up the 20%. All right. Um, and yeah, they're not in, he includes it in a secondary type of um, volume tracker, but um, not much with the other stuff. All right. So the whole idea behind having the swing of high, medium, and low stress training days. So Arkady Vorobyov, who was a, he was either a three or four time Olympian in, in weightlifting. So like the thing about like Russian sports science is their coaches are also sports scientists. So they stop competing at a high level and then they go into these schools mm -hmm. and then they do their research. So they bring the experience, right? So like I always say, like experiential knowledge plus intellectual knowledge is wisdom, right? So mm -hmm. they just have like both. We're here, we got some nerd in a lab coat judging Donnie Dickhead how high he can jump after squatting 200 pounds. And then we have, you know, Maddie Meathead over here who's saying like, this is how, like we don't have that like same mm -hmm. combination that they have. So he did this research where it was like traditional methods where you'd have like ramping up, deload, ramping up compared to going high, medium, low stress training days, integrated throughout a week. And there was some individualization with it. And it showed in his research that it yielded much higher results doing it that way, um, which is actually interesting because, like, when you auto-regulate a conjugate system, it ends up being very, very similar mm -hmm. um, to doing this. So basically, the way you'd individualize it is, you know, the more high-stress training days that somebody can tolerate, the better it's going to be. But you can only do the work that you're capable of recovering from. Yeah. Um, and so you'd kind of integrate that throughout. And the way he would... Um, have me do it is after each day I'd write either just easy, medium, or hard. There was no like RPE number system to mm -hmm. go along with it. Just like very simple communication with that. Um, and he would just kind of like adjust as we went along. Um, but like w there were some like fascinating things when I was going through it that, um, so like one of the things he never raised my number of lifts. So even as my total went from being a beginner to like more in that like class two, class three range and my number of lifts never went up. So as long as my progress was going up, right, the whole idea, it's like step loading, right? Mm -hmm. So like you hit these numbers over and over and over, you get new maxes, you go back, you hit them over and over, your volume's going to increase anyways. So the whole idea behind it is you're trying to increase efficiency. So for him, load variability was one of the most important aspects of training. And the way that he would do it is you'd always be in your comp stance, comp grip, it'd always be a straight bar. Um, so like I pulled conventional, I never pulled sumo. Uh, we paused our benches all the time, or at least the first one of a, of a set. And the whole idea is you're trying to increase efficiency of the lift. So he laid out in terms of technique, all these like different aspects of the lift. Each aspect has its own like motor behavior, like unracking the bar is its own thing. Walking out is its own thing. The eccentric portion is its own thing that amortization phase, so that space between the eccentric and concentric, right? And then the concentric. But that's where I've always been confused with this type of training when it comes to the tracking of the comp lifts, because if it's a triple, you only walk out once. So the specificity of the walkout is just once. That's a good point. But yet that determines everything that happens after that first rep. Same with the bench, right? And same with the deadlift, unless you're you know stepping back and stepping forward, right. you're gonna have a stretch reflex associated with that second rep. So is that actually specificity or is it not? And it's certainly not a comp lift because you're not getting a squat command and the verbal command on the squat is essential in the squat. You know, so it's, 
that's where, you know, it, and it, it doesn't change how the training moves. It doesn't change all that. But I like to have, you know, agreement on what it means, right? Because to me, a comp lift is the setup, if it's a monolift or the walkout, all the way to putting it back in. That's a comp lift. So when we're talking specificity, we have to talk, like you just said, all those components of the lift, that's the specificity. As soon as you remove the walkout, you know, if that is what's being judged, you just took out a quarter, 20% of the, actually I can say one of the most important aspects of the whole fucking lift. So now that doesn't change what the development of the strength throughout that, but it does change the conversation of specificity a lot, mm -hmm. especially when you're comparing it with a program that say maybe Bulgarian based, all singles. You know, where now you can say, well, all singles has more specificity because there's all walkouts. You see, you get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. um, but anyhow, I just kind of went down a sidetrack, but keep going. No, that's a great point. Um, and as you're talking, I, I just started to like really think even in terms of like the specificity. So like specificity, and this is where like the Internet, I think, misunderstands the term. <clears throat> It's a sensory motor, motor experience. Yeah. Right? Your internal environment is experiencing forces. It doesn't see what you see on Instagram, on Instagram or whatever. And the thought that came to my mind was, like, when we do max effort work, not only are we walking out singles, we're walking out heavy singles. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, if you have never squatted with a lot of chain on a bar and trying to walk it out, like, that shit sucks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Swinging all yeah. over the place. Like, um, so you're getting more specific walkouts. And if it is one of the, if not the most important part of the lift, why wouldn't you want to practice that more, mm -hmm. right? And like when people get tired, so we would do these like squat pyramids with Shaco where it'd be around like 70%. You'd do like three, five, seven, nine, eight, six, four. So you'd kind of go up at reps and then down. Mm -hmm. So let's take that like set of nine by like reps three or four, you know, most people's chin when they're locking it out is coming down into their head. They're trying to take extra breaths. So the bars is moving all over their back. So like that specificity of that part of the lift itself is probably very low. Unless you're missing, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You yeah. have to drive through that. Exactly. So it could be that. But on terms of like specificity too, um, if you're pausing, like we would pause on the halfway down, we'd pause on the halfway up. We might pause in multiple places. Like it was very like weightlifting esque in terms of like, the technical execution of the the variations within mm -hmm. the within the lifts themselves and the whole idea is you're trying to increase efficiency which actually decreases your ability to produce force you're trying to be more efficient which means you're actually producing less force under those given weights so it frees up motor units so you can hit mm -hmm. that max effort later on where like a conjugate system you're looking to produce more force and that's going to allow you to produce more force. So the, they're different in like in that aspect of what they're kind of like that technique versus mm -hmm. um, for strength. And um, and what's interesting as my brain bounces around here. Um, so as you were mentioning the bell shaped curve. So at that point where I knew fucking everything, Shaco came out here for a second time and he actually went out to West Side mm -hmm. and visited with Louie and stuff. So then he came uh, to the gym and did a seminar and a training session. And so, you know, I was asking him about, like, how that was meeting Louie and stuff like that. And he goes, powerlifting's a big enough wor world where we can have multiple methods mm -hmm. and allow each other to get strong. And he, he was talking about, like, how smart he was. And then he, was, he goes, the differences are force versus technique, strength versus technique, where Louie's going to focus on strength first. I'm going to focus on technique first. Um, which I found like really interesting. And then, I mean, he loved some of the stuff, like, uh, some of the bars that Louis had, some of mm -hmm. the machines. So he actually took some like blueprints back, um, to utilize that stuff. So like when we look at these programs too, like one thing that I think people miss the mark on is in Russia, they didn't have access to some of the stuff that we have access to now. So like one of my arguments, well, not arguments because as you go through that bell shaped yeah. curve, you want to show everybody, you know, everything. Yeah. So when they have an argument, you're like, here's this huge response that I'm going to have for it. And so now when it's like, when you get these like higher frequency comp lift programs and people are like, well, it's more specific. And it's like, okay, let's take a step back. What did they have access to at first? They had a rack, a barbell and some plates. So they started squatting, benching and deadlifting. Why does all this stuff exist? Like there became a need for it. If yeah. that was how things were best run, we would have just done that forever. Like we would have figured that back out in 1940. We wouldn't have been sitting here with SSBs and 
um, all the machines, yeah. like the inverse curl machine and stuff like that. Like we never would have done that stuff. Um, and like the other thing too, like when you talk about like Shaco's philosophy, you got to understand he came from the Russian system, right? So they have schools. So they have a long-term athletic development program. So these kids, when they're six to nine years old, they do like gymnastics, swimming, climbing, stuff like that, like basic movement stuff. And then, and what's actually interesting is then there became an arms race of physical education. So that's when we started doing our like one mile run, the president's challenge. Like yeah. it was because people were failing out of the um, boot camps when they were being uh, uh, drafted. So, and then let's say they go to a school and it's going to be weightlifting. They go to the school in the early years, it's all GPP. So it's very little specific programming. So they're building a large base, and then eventually they might grab like a broom stick or a PVC pipe, something small. And then they start building in. And here, it's actually less days. So they'll train three days a week, very small volume of specific work. And then over time, as they mature as an athlete, the specific work grows and the GPP shrinks. So when you look at like Shaco, where it's going to be 60% of the lifts are going to be variations, 20% are going to be comp lifts, and 20% are going to be the GPP exercises. It makes sense because he's a national team coach. So by the time these lifters get to his national team, they've been lifting for 10 to 15 years. They built the base. And when you look here in, a, in America, when you see lifters that are successful on a very specific program, a higher frequency, higher specificity program, there'll be two things that tend to happen. One, they had a long history. Typically, they'll play football or were bodybuilders, where football teams here are in the weight room, so they started lifting really young. Um, and bodybuilders, obviously, they're building the GPP, so there's a lot of GPP, where, like, for me, for soccer, weights was just not a, a big thing. We might go to the gym twice a week, hit some trap bar deadlifts and some split squats. We're not putting a bar on our back and really like developing absolute strength the same way. Whether we should or we shouldn't, that's a, that's a different debate. But as they mature as an athlete and the specificity is increasing, their first competitions, they're judged based off of technique, almost as if weightlifting is a gymnastic sport. Yeah. So the beginners, it's literally you get a score based off of your technical abilities. And then over time, as they start working their way up, obviously specificity increases. Um, oh, and the other part too is they'll have really good leverages, right? So if you take an American lifter here who does really well on a very specific program, if I can lock out a deadlift at my knees, it's going to save my lower back. Of course I can get into a better start position because it's easier. I don't have to re-extend at the top. I can handle more volume of stuff um, because I'm actually doing less overall work. Um, and the same thing happens even in Russia. I mean, they have early specialized, not early specialization, but um, they're selecting athletes based off of what they think they're going to be good at. So as they go through these schools, if they get stuck, they're given a certificate and they, and they leave the school. So by the time they get to Shaco, they're the cream of the crop. They've been lifting for a long time. They have good leverages. They've been able to um, continuously make improvements, and then they get into that program. Where here you might have that beginner who's done absolutely nothing getting into this very hyper-specific program without a base, right? So, like, you know, the whole, like, bigger the base, the higher the peak type of thing. And I think there's some truth to that in this in terms of not even just, like, the longevity of an athlete, but, like, early specialization in every sport comes with an early peak. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in some sports it may be like, hey – you know, like for me, I couldn't afford to go to college as a kid. So like for me to peak as a senior in high school might be the most appropriate action, right? So maybe early specialization gets me into college and gives me a better life, right? Or gymnastics where you're in the Olympics at 16, 14, like you're really young because of the certain biomechanical pieces of, you know, the flexibility, the size of you and all of those things. Maybe early specialization matters there. But you're going to come with an earlier and you're going to come with a smaller peak. It's no different for strength sports. Like if your lower back is only capable of, you know, Louis, what would he say? Like you're a thousand pound squatter, you have yeah. thousand pound legs and a 700 pound yeah. lower back mm. or something. Like if there's a weak link in that chain and you're not doing anything like that is going to be your peak. That's just where it's going to end at the. Yeah. Um, so they're pre-selected into these 
Russian national team programs. And I think the thing here is it's, it's just become very like commercialized where one, I can give it to everybody cause you can do it. At, you can do it at a crunch fitness or workout mm-hmm. world. Like you can grab a bar and just do it. And what it does is if you get enough people involved, it finds the people who are built for it. And then the people who are built for it, do it. And then you get your, you know, other people seeing them do that. And it's like, well, they're doing that. So I should do that. But with Louis, how would be the opposite? It was 80% GPP, he would say, and then 20% everything else. It's flipped on its head because a lot of people here just don't have that. So when I actually went out there and I'm having a conversation with him, he goes, I just hope somebody, when they walk through these doors, played high school sports so they're a little bit explosive, right? And like mm-hmm. he'll try to build that base as he's trying to build the total at the same time. So even though it seems very different because they're, they're flipped, it's almost very similar at the same time. They're trying to accomplish the same things. And then what that tells you is the person in front of you fucking matters. Their background, yeah. their build, all of these things. And it's like, and obviously like personality probably plays a role in this. Um, like I was listening to the, uh, when you interviewed John Hack and he's mm-hmm. like, I, fu- I fucking hate conjugate because like I, I couldn't do the, yeah. the different things all the time. And it's like, man, I can totally relate to that the other way. Cause like I did it. I was bored out of my yeah. mind. Like I want to be able to, you know, put on some hard music, huff a fucking cap, and just do something stupid in the gym every once yeah, in a while. I think it matters a lot because, I mean, people, some people are motivated more by certainty, some people by uncertainty. Yeah. And sometimes their career paths will be decided by that. You know, a, somebody who works customer service is probably more motivated by uncertainty than point. certainty. You know, and so that could be why people love or hate their jobs. And in the strength and conditioning realm, the word specificity, a lot of these words are, um, shittily defined, especially within context that most people are presenting the information in, you know, um, short form content, video, article, whatever it's going to be, because I can look at specificity and I can say specificity of what? Specific, specific, let's take it outside of powerlifting, let's football, specificity of the skill position. Right. So now there's there's that. And then specificity of that skill position means play, you know, practice a game actually is full specificity because high emotional demand, everything's on the line. Every play matters. All this matters. That's specificity at the highest level where game practice, you know, uh, one on one, whatever you call it, scrimmage type shit. Scrimmage would probably be second. And then after that's if you're talking skill you know, actually game skill, but then there's also their position skill. The first step is alignment, you know, how the pulling guard, how they're going to pull, how they're going to come off the ball. All these individual are technical skills. So in powerlifting, we have the competitive specificity, right? Which we kind of already talked about, but then you have the movement pattern specificity, and then you're going to have the energy demand specificity. Then you're going to have the psychological demand specificity you know there's a lot of different things that are specificity where it just seems to be always defined as movement pattern slash competition yeah right because there there's variants that you can work outside of that specificity you know to be able to help because if if we're going to define specificity in all other sports the way that a lot of people define it in powerlifting then no football player will ever do anything except play competitive football against opponents that they're not on the same team with. Right. And and that, that, that would be great if they can recover from it, you know, mentally, physically, that's a whole other conversation is, you know, you can adapt to a lot of different things. And I think that people limit what they can adapt to, you know, it's a there, that's, that's a whole other conversation there. But, um, and I think that, Boris was looking at specificity more so than what people are giving him credit for, you know, instead of just that competition specificity, the example being what we talked about before multiple repetitions in a set. Well, there's still specificity there of basic movement pattern, energy demand, you know, under fatigue, you know, that's a skill, skill acquisition is a whole other process where it's easy to teach somebody how to squat with a broomstick. Then you tell them what to do then they got to tell themselves what to do. Then they have to be able to do that with load. Then they have to learn how to do that with load under high stress. Yeah. Then they have to learn how to do that with load under high stress in a competitive environment where the judge may or may not know what the fuck they're doing. 
you know, under chaos, you can't go from one to the other without training, you know, with, and that's specificity, you see, yeah. you know, so it's, it's a broad thing that in strength and conditioning, all these broad things, people try to define them in very narrow context. And I get it because that's how you're going to, how long is that article going to be if you had to define it in a broad context? Right. And even then with the specificity too, right? It's the specificity. Let's say you want to improve somebody's technique. Are you just trying to make them efficient with what they have now? Or are you trying to be like, hey, because at some point, like, I know there's two different ways and like people argue on the internet about how to teach a squat. Mm -hmm. Like we wear flats. I want your shoulders to be at least a little bit outside of your, I mean, your heels to be a little bit outside of your shoulders. Sit back a little bit. Like, so Shaka was big on not letting, like powerlifting style Mm -hmm. squat of, versus the Olympic style squat. So like not letting the knees go past the halfway point of the feet was his mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you're teaching a specific technique, the training has to be specific towards the improved technique, not the technique that they have now if you're trying to make them better at mm-hmm. it, right? So it's not even this, you're not even playing this game in the present. You're playing this game in the present to try to create a different person, right? And so, like, then you look at, like, things. So, like, in soccer, as you get older, you want to learn how to play fast. You want to get these two-on-ones, three-v-twos in spaces to be able to get numbers moving forward, right? So we didn't do that by playing games all the time. We did that by playing small-sided games. Mm -hmm. So you really, really shrink the field. You shrink the space that you get to use, and it forces you to get your head up, to get the ball out quicker, to pay attention where the defender is. You have to be able to take in all of that information, process it really fast, and be able to make the right adjustments, right? It's a quarterback in football in the NFL, right? They're getting rid of the ball in two and a half, three seconds. Like, they're taking in all of this information. So if you want to play fast, you got to play faster in practice, right, to build some of those components. That's specific to the game of soccer, even though it might be three-on-three in a very small-sided game, Mm -hmm. right? So, like, you take an exercise like a good morning. Well, if specificity is a sensory motor experience – what do you think your low back hips and hamstrings are experiencing on that good morning? They're experiencing specific forces. Um, I heard this was on a, I think it was on the West side podcast. I heard somebody talk about how the cells language is force. And I really liked that because it is right. So the language that's being spoken when you're doing a good morning to those areas, there's a lot of internal force happening there. That's no different from a deadlift. That's no different from a, squat in the hole i think it was mike bridges right he said a, a squat is just a good morning to depth and mm-hmm. most will argue he's one of the most technical lifters and i mean pound for pound arguably the greatest lifter that ever that ever lived yeah. um so like in terms of like specificity you got to think of the forces involved you got to think of the angles and it's not about the external environment it's about the internal environment like what is this person going through and what type of internal environment am i trying to set up to produce the results that that I'm looking for. So like somebody like Shaco, he's pausing in various places where Louis putting bands on the bar and not pausing, but move faster. Um, they're all specific to what they're trying to train, right? If you have a weak area in a lift and the safety squat bar highlights it, how is that not specific to you as an individual to get stronger? It's creating a sensory motor experience where those angles are being stressed the most that are holding you back. Yeah. Um, and at times too, you can use that to your advantage. Like, um, maybe do a Zercher squat max effort one day because you're feeling fucking banged up. As soon as your upper back gives up, your arms aren't holding that weight. You're just fucking done. And you're just going to move on to something else. Right. So like, I don't know, to me, it just never made sense in any sport. Why wouldn't you work on your weaknesses? Well, there's things can be done for more than one reason. Right. Which is, which is, You know, if you use a dynamic effort method as a classic example of people wanting to see it for one reason and not a lot of others, where many years ago I used to do seminars with Mel Siff. And one of the things that because we were talking about good mornings was an example and um, a good morning squat was another example. Good morning down squat, stand back up. And as we were talking about these things, there is, you know, building the weak points and all that. But he referred it back to me as chaos training. You know, if, if you are going to miss a squat, typically what happens? You know, you're going to fall forward. So how, if that is to happen, what is your rescue plan? You know, what, what is your, what is your, um, 
be, I guess rescue care is probably the best word for that. Like, what if you're not ready for the rescue plan? You know, what if you don't have that? You know, and that is what a good morning essentially is. And then the conversation became, if you have to create those rescue plans for each one of your lifts, because they will break down with maximum weight, they'll break down. Maybe not, but if you put 110, if you put on more than you can lift, it will break down. And so where it's gonna break down then is in this form of chaos training, what is the safest variation that you can do, you know, to be able to condition yourself for when that time does come, you're automatically gonna know recover, you know, and the bench, the deadlift, whatever those other things in there. And that goes with, you know, it's, if people were pushing the, the back on a good morning for X reason, then it's like, okay, fine, I agree, here's this. You know, then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. And, and now if you can go through the multiple reasons why something could work, and then all of them suck, then it probably shouldn't be in the program, right? <laughs> and at the same time, I could also flip it and say, any coach or lifter should have multiple reasons why they're implementing something in a program, not just one. Right. Yeah. And then if they can't come up with multiple reasons then maybe they don't want to put it in because there's probably something better. And um, that was a big takeaway I had from him on that. And it's, it's, it's interesting because that was the, actual, the, the movement that started the whole conversation, because it, at the time we were doing an ass load of good mornings. I'm like, I don't fucking get this because I came from a linear periodization, just basically yep. do the main lifts and then some bodybuilding shit afterwards. I'm like, I don't fucking get this. I don't like them for one thing, which is the main reason why I didn't get it, <laughs> right? I don't like them. And um, so then it's like, what are the purpose? You know, what, what's it in there for? And this whole conversation began. Then it was like, oh shit, I, what I really don't like is missing a fucking squat, right? When you come out and it's like, fuck, I got this. And it's, then you fall forward. That pisses me off worse than if I just got crushed in the bottom. <laughs> yeah. When the world's tipping upside down, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, there's a, um, so actually when, so I went out to Westside for a weekend, um, and on their dynamic effort day, Louis had us standing on these, I mean, they had to be 16 inch, like Tempur-Pedic fucking mattress blocks. Mm -hmm. And so it was, an SSB it was bands and like the first time you step on these things you're like what the fuck like I'm gonna get fucking killed mm -hmm. um, he was talking about I think they were using it for like track and field athletes for sprinting to get more like leg drive and stuff which I definitely felt it more in my legs um, but at the same time like that chaos training that you're talking about right so like in terms of when you're trying to learn a skill so what Shaco is trying to do by having you repeat the same thing over and over is you have these upper upper levels that your attention network when it grabs it your body's in a learning state right so the example i use in my lifters all the time is like when you learn how to drive your hands gonna be 10 and 2 you're gonna be white knuckling the the wheel the music might be low or off and then later on you're taking fucking selfies the music's fucking blasting you got one hand on the wheel like you're driving places not even realizing right so what happens is in the beginning the attention network kicks off you're learning something then it pushes it into what's called central pattern generators. It's lower levels. It's where our movement becomes habitualized because your body always wants to conserve energy. And so when you get into this situation that you've never experienced before, your attention network kicks on. It's how you develop skill. But what Shaco wants is he wants that movement pattern under new loads, right? The step loading process. So let's say you started, you're a 500 pound squatter. Now you're a 525 squatter. And then you're a 550 squatter. At each step, what you're trying to improve upon is your efficiency at those loads to push it down habitualize it you're more efficient it doesn't cost as much energy anymore so now you have freed up energy to lift the bigger weights with the the chaos type of like with that exercise like i'm looking at it, i'm like this is the stupidest fucking thing i've ever done in my life but it really caught my attention by the end of it i'm moving much faster i got the hang of it and um when you add in that type of training where you're doing different things. So like, there's even like, I mean, I see some stuff on the internet where I'm like, this exercise looks like fucking stupid or dangerous or, but maybe it just serves that purpose where it's grabbing the attention of somebody. And what's interesting about like an exercise like that, if you give somebody something that they've never done before, how fast they can pick it up. Like somebody who's played sports previously will probably pick it up in that one day. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's an elite lifter will probably, 
not only pick it up during the warm ups, but be able to execute it at a high level. Right. So like um, an analogy I, I, I think is good is like when you look at like baseball players, a minor league baseball player might be making adjustments from at bat to at bat where a major league baseball player is making adjustments pitch to pitch. And I think you can see that in terms of like skill level kind of come out in these things. But when you're giving variety in training like that, that chaos type of training, it's catching that attention network in your brain's attention. And that's how you develop skill. Your brain wants to know that it, it needs to execute a certain movement pattern in a variety of different ways in its environment to fucking care enough mm -hmm. to give enough energy to develop those higher levels of coordination. But when your training becomes predictable, you're trying to do the exact opposite. You're trying to teach your body to become efficient and conserve energy. And I think, you know, with the dick measuring contests that happen on the internet all the time, it's like you need to understand what you're trying to develop within your own training programs. If you're trying to develop efficiency, that's fine. But don't be using, you know, this study said this. Like, don't, don't be using that stuff to try to be like, like uh, when it's uh, singles further away from failure or better for developing strength. Well, no fucking shit. We're not testing our comp squat every fucking mm. week. Like, we know we can't do that. So if your goal is to develop efficiency within the lifts, use your RPE8 singles. That makes sense to me because you have to scale it back to be able to recover, to be able to do your other work, and you're trying to develop efficiency. That weight's probably fine. But if you're trying to develop great higher levels of coordination, which is what a conjugate program does, max effort is to develop that coordination to move max weights. Dynamic effort is to develop the coordination to hit max force more quickly. If you're trying to develop higher levels of coordination, there has to be variety in it because you need to get the brain to fucking care to be like, hey, I got to do this squat pattern in so many different ways within my environment. I'm going to give this energy to develop those higher levels of coordination. And so one of the things that got me to change things, I had this, I had, um, this one girl, she was really strong. Um, but her deadlift, like her legs would straighten back round, like typical, like beginner deadlift. And no matter what I did within the, the Shaco philosophy, like pauses at the, at the knees, pauses right off the ground. Like no matter what we would do these, uh, deadlift plus deadlift below the knees. So you'd lift it up and then you'd bring it down without touching the ground as far as you can. So you get that eccentric, you're in better positions. Nothing worked. Her just, her deadlift would not get better. And it's like, Man, I don't know. And it's obviously we're not hitting the weak areas, right? We're just trying to develop mm -hmm. it within the lift itself. Um, and it's just like, okay, well, if I'm trying to get more efficient and these things aren't working, what's next? And so she didn't hit a deadlift PR for, I want to say it was close to three years. And then her last nationals that she ended up doing, she finally hit a deadlift PR. We just decided to pull conventional in training a lot and do other things. And then when she went back to her sumo deadlift, there's her first PR in three years. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you want to get into this like specificity. Yes, the kinematics of the movement, if I'm pausing at the knees, is more specific to the technique. But it's not specific to what she needs. And it just wasn't like building that, um, that same aspect. And I think it's because you've deadlifted like this the whole time. Like we need to get your brain to think about something else. Right? So you throw heavy bands on a bar. Right. All of a sudden, like, yeah, it may look like the same movement, but your body's going to learn how to beat those bands off the ground. Like everybody wants to talk about it overloading the top. It doesn't. It's a neurological adaptation that has to happen earlier on because your body's responding to that sensory motor experience of, holy shit, these bands are kicking on hard and fast. I need to be harder and faster from the start of the lift. Mm -hmm. and like we started doing these things and all of a sudden, boom, things started getting better. We started lifting less with the comp lifts and technique just breaks down far less and so there's this i think what we end up getting and it's probably always been this way is it's always this all or nothing thought process with something well dynamic effort work sucks so mm -hmm. don't do it at all okay max effort if we're further away from failure don't do it at all or we always it's like okay well one take that person in front of you how much practice do they actually need in the comp list? And one, in terms of like skill acquisition, you, if you want to improve technique, that old technique needs to become unstable. If it's stable, it's just going to stay the same. So if you're practicing it too much, how are you going to fix it? You can't. So you have to find enough of a break. So, um, and it's called dynamic systems theory, but in one of the um, studies that I read, in order to change, so somebody had... I think it was a backhand tennis stroke that they were trying to switch, a double-handed backhand tennis stroke. 
So what they did for six weeks is they had them hold a tennis ball in one hand so they just couldn't do it. So finally that skill erodes and then you can kind of put in a new skill on top of it. So you need to remove it enough, give them enough variety within the context of that same movement, but have it in enough that it's not so foreign. And then you end up getting pe better technique on the other side of it. And so it's, it's a recipe, but it's more like baking, right? Mm -hmm. Where like each little piece matters a little bit more. And so you got to take that person in front of you. Well, how many comp lifts do they need? Well, they probably don't need any. Like, I mean, I can take it out for months, put a straight bar on my back. And like at some point, a squat's just a squat. It feels fine. Right. But you got to take in the, the psychological pieces of the lifter, too. If they're nervous, all of a sudden technique's going to erode. So they have to have enough practice to feel confident enough in it. Right. So like I think the easiest thing that like we do now is like week four. So you run a typical like three week wave week four. Just do comp lifts. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll replace max effort sometimes with 75 percent squats five by five. Like something we might have done with Shaco. Right. I don't I don't pause and stuff like uh, like he would. But we'll practice the lifts in these spots. Um, dynamic effort work. It was like, okay, beginners don't necessarily know how to express force dynamically. How do they learn? And so there's a free app that we've been using to measure velocities. And what's interesting is you'll see a beginner where the first rep might be 0.7 meters per second. Second one, 0.75. Third one, 0.85. Like they get faster each rep. But if you get underneath that bar, you're going to be fastest first. Mm -hmm. Second one's going to drop a little bit. Third, it's just boom. It's going to fall off right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, maybe that's not necessarily, I mean, in those ranges it would be, but maybe that's not necessarily speed work because they're not moving to their max speeds, but that's them figuring it out. Yeah. It's a trained attribute. It's a trained attribute. Yeah. So like, what do I need to do to get them to do that first? Right. Mm -hmm. So then there's conversations and then you just keep tracking it over time, but you can do box jumps. You can do plyometric training. The idea of dynamic effort work is it's, plyometrics it's sports specific plyometrics mm -hmm. um what they actually called plyometrics in the eastern blocks they called it kinetic energy accumulation training right so then you had like verkashansky's shock method we just call it plyometrics here louis found a way to do that in a sports specific manner so to me it's a sports specific plyometric for powerlifting. it makes sense um you know and even with the box squats well how, how much box squatting do we need to do some people find that they need it out more frequently. Some people, like me, I use, for me, doing dynamic effort work with free squats just feels fucking weird. If there's, like, you just can't hit the, there's just not enough weight to hit the hole the same way. So I always use a, use a box. And, you know, where people are like, well, the technique's different. We're not specifically working on technique on that day. You absolutely could if you wanted to. But if I want to work on technique, maybe I remove the bands. Maybe we do some straight weight. And maybe we just do some sets and reps. Like, it, it's not this all or nothing thing. It's like, don't, what's interesting is, is like, you'll get these groups on the internet that just kind of push all these, all these tools away, right? It's like, this stuff doesn't work, but this does. And they're just stuck with this one thing. Well, what happens when it stops working? Because it's going to stop mm -hmm. working. What are you going to do? And then what ends up happening, and th this is where I get with like, why do people burn out on the sport? So let's say it happens year three, year four. You've spent... All that time, you have no training skill. You have no understanding of what you need to do to get better. So you're a beginner in terms of your ideas of on how to fix things within the gym setting itself. All you know is the comp lifts, right? You grab a specialty bar and or try to squat with bands or pull with bands. All of a sudden, you're going to be like, holy shit, this feels way different. It's going to catch your attention. You're going to learn something. You'll find all these weaknesses that you can work on to improve upon. Um but it doesn't have to be this all or nothing thing. All of these methods have a place and you just got to know when to use them, where to use them, how much of it. So like I've gone on this like back and forth um, piece with beginners and the dynamic effort stuff. Now, if they're true, true beginners, we're not putting bands on a bar or anything mm -hmm. like that. Let's say year of training in like, yeah, they don't know how to express it dynamically, but at the end of the day, it's taking up 15 minutes of our entire training week. Who fucking cares? Like figure it out, learn it. Mm -hmm. you know learn how your body moves faster and you'll see them like you know pitching forward or they just can't necessarily get that drive to it and then maybe what you or or you'll see this right where week one they'll be in those ranges week two maybe and then week three it's just heavy at that point all right we'll just change week three that doesn't have to be how louis did dynamic effort maybe you put just some sets and reps in there 
you know, maybe you hit some 80% comp squats or something, or like, maybe you just don't care and you just let it be a little heavier on that day. Like you can manipulate these, all these methods to, you know, fit the needs of the person that's in front of you. It doesn't have to be this like, um, super black and white thing. And I mean, you talk about the auto regulation stuff all the time. And I would imagine this is what you guys did. Oh, it is. I mean, it's, I, I look at everything through a lens of, you know, all weak points are mental, physical or technical. You know, there's, there's nothing outside of that. So with max effort work, you know, there's, there's the coordinational component. There's the components that most people will talk about, but there's also learning the ability to strain. Most beginners don't know how to strain. And if it begins to strain, they'll quit because it doesn't feel normal to them. Right. So, and, and so that's just one, one, one technical aspect of lifting maximal weights is to be able to strain through them. The higher level aspect of that is how can you strain through it and think what to do if it's not doing what you want it to do? Now, most people will say and push back and say, oh, I don't think of shit. I just, just go. I'm like, really? Be honest with me now. Like, right before you know that you're not going to get it, you don't think anything. Like, your brain doesn't say, fuck. And no point in there does your brain say, I got this. You're, you don't think anything. Well, yeah, I do. Well, then maybe we can change that dialogue. So when it starts to feel like fuck, you can think, what's not moving right? Push my hips forward. What's not moving right? Arch my back. What's not moving right? Drive my knees out. And the only way that you can do that is being in that position, you know, and perhaps putting the bands on that's going to increase the time under tension a little bit, lower the load, you know, so now it's just a longer strained rep, you know, and putting the body in that ability to just think. Not even think the right things, but just realize you're thinking, you know, why you do that. Because that's the difference between a high level lifter making or missing is realizing, fuck, this is not in position. Do this. Now, people will say, oh, it should be automatic. Well, I'll tell you, you haven't lifted enough fucking big weights <laughs> to know. Sometimes it's not automatic. And, you know, on the, the dynamic effort side, there's there's the, the technical practice to where I disagree. I mean, I don't think you should be on a box all the time. I don't have the lifter stand a box all the time. I do believe that the box should simulate what the free squat is. You know, so if it is Boris's stance, where if it is medium, I would agree. The knee yeah. should be about midfoot. Then the box squat needs to be about midfoot. But what I like with the technical ability with a box squat or even the dynamic work, let's say, for instance, it doesn't do anything to develop explosive strength. I'll just say, fuck it. They're right. Doesn't do anything. <laughs> There's still, if it's, if, if it's an eight set day, there's eight first reps, mm -hmm. including the walkout, which according to most programs that have two top sets, that's fucking four times higher. That's 400% higher on specificity of first rep squats. Yeah. And if it's a beginner, one of the worst, one of the hardest things to teach them after the rep is when they fuck it up at the bottom. So now you can say stop. And while they're on the bottom, you can correct their positioning and say, stand up, sit, stop fix the positioning, stand up. So you can actually teach the lift from bottom up instead of top down. This is technical training, right? So fuck the dynamic work, that don't work. Fuck that, the technical work, let's look at that. So breaking the lift down into components is bad. You know, fixing the broken squat at the bottom, that's bad. You know, teaching them to stand up with compensatory, like, you know, with speed, that's bad. You know, teaching them to have the right position when they sit, because you can stop. Have them stop in the bottom of a, a beginner. Have them squat down and fucking stop. And then say, okay, now here, what I want you to do, push your feet out more. Fuck. It's a beginner. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're lucky if they're even paying attention. Oh. Where now when you can stop it and fix it, again, it has multiple reasons why it's in there. And that was, when I was at the West Side, that was... When I got in there, we didn't have a monolift, you know, so it was jack stands. We didn't have bands. We didn't fuck. We didn't even have boards. Boards came in after like the first year I was there, you know, so a lot of the things that people assume that we never did is all we did, you know, was that stuff. And a lot, especially for me when I came in, because I didn't do a lot of box squats, you know, I, I rebounded, you know, and had a lot of explosive power. So I wasn't even utilizing my biggest attribute was the explosive power. I can't, man, it would say, you know, sit one, two, three up, you know, so it was learning and learning and learning and, and you know, all that was that skill attribute. Cause I had to, 
now you're taking somebody that's competed for eight years. Fuck, maybe 10, I'd have to think. All those ingrained movement patterns. And when I was younger, I had really good coaching. You know, always, it was still linear, but we always did something in the 70% range as a secondary movement, usually a high pin squat or something like that, or a walkout, something to dial all that in. You know, and obviously, I mean, over the first three year, I think when I was 14, 15, I squatted 14, 20, 220 or some shit. And single ply, because raw wasn't really a thing. And, but that was because my squat didn't suck so bad. You know, it was, it still wasn't great, but the technique was so refined. And I picked up on it because it's like, oh, this is like wrestling. This is like position drills in football. I got to learn this, 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 and this. And um, that's so it, when with the lens that I look at things, mental, physical, technical, I can look at any of the programs that are out there and then use any of them really and say, okay, this with this lifter, this lifter needs more focus on the technical aspect. So let's change this to put that in there. You know, this, and the funny thing in this world that we live in, everybody defaults to the physical. Like, man, my bench sucks, man, my lockout's terrible. What exercise do I need for my lockout? And you know, I'm like, motherfucker, man, maybe you're just not pushing through it, so it's mental. Maybe your technique sucks, you're not in a good position to even finish it, but you wanna go to like fucking skull crushers <laughs> you know, but that's, sure. that's the world that we live in where the answer is normally one of the other two. And fuck, we already know there's multiple ways to create world champions. I could say that not any two world champions are created exactly the same way. So I can push against it the other way and said there is no specialization. It's all individualization. Mm. Right. Because nobody's got to the top doing exactly the same thing. Right. Nobody. Because even they adjust their warm ups if it doesn't feel right, they're doing extra set, you know. So there's always that variance where the coach has to have the ability, and we'll talk about how you manage the max effort stuff to be able to help that lifter learn those things, you know. Because at the end, as you talked earlier, at the end, that's what's going to matter the most. Because if they're all different at the end, then the this the goal of the coach or the lifter is to embrace the difference and figure out what they need to do. So when, cause the, some of the things cause you moved into conjugate from Chico and one of the things with the max effort is there's always been a, a huge degree of variations amongst training crews, groups, people, and all this other stuff. The only time there's similarity is if there's a crew and you're just like, trying to figure out what's the best compromise for everybody to do at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and hopefully it's not all based upon the strongest guy in the gym. You know, there's needs to be some compromise in there, but a beginner is going to obviously, and you work more with beginners than the higher end, you know, and you got both, but most it's there. It's different, you know, so how have you programmed and put that into the training? So with the max effort stuff, <clears throat> So a true beginner, I mean, I'm probably not giving them singles in the beginning. Like, we'll do fives, we'll do threes. We might even do, like, more of a linear thing. Um, what I – so once you build this base, so it'll just kind of be, like, what I'm seeing. Eventually what we'll get into is we'll pick one exercise for a block. And so let's say it's a safety squat bar, a box squat with chains or something on it. Because most beginners, I'm not giving bands either. Like, there's going to be a, a working up to it. So they might do that week one with like a conservative max effort. Like, hey, stop when you got five to 10 pounds off the bar. Because I think one of the things in the beginning, there's, a, there's quite a few things that like need to be worked on. And one, in order for them to auto-regulate, they have to know what they're capable of doing. And most people just don't know what they're capable of doing yet. And two... What week, do you mean by that? So, so let's say week one, I tell them to um, leave five to 10 pounds on the bar. Mm -hmm. Week two, we'll do some reps of that same exercise. Week three, beat week one by five pounds. A beginner will beat week one by 40 pounds. Okay. And it's like, okay, you didn't leave five to 10 pounds there. You okay. left 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Cause they just don't know how to strain. They don't know what it feels mm -hmm. like. They don't know what that, like that threshold where it actually exists. So you got to teach them where that threshold exists, but you also got to teach them how to talk to themselves before they get underneath that bar. Right. So like I took what Shaco did with breaking up the lifts into there's this spot before you lift 
that probably matters just as much as unracking it, standing up with it. It's like, what are you telling yourself at the chalk bowl? And like, so everybody would be like, I'm telling myself I got this. And I'll be like, motherfucker, you got this till you don't. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't bullshit yourself. You, you fucking know. So you can say that all you want, but what are you going to do when you miss? Right? Because the next time you say, I got this, you're, you remember missing it. Mm-hmm. Right? So like, we work on that, like, how we're going to talk to ourselves in, in that moment in time. So like, I have everybody, they'll do their core values and then come up with like a personal statement. Right? It can be whatever the fuck you want. Right? But like, you know, it could be as much as, you know what, I'm going to just give my best effort underneath this time for thinking's done time for doing, mm-hmm. let's go do it. Um, you know, cause I, I think most beginners that psyche is so fragile, right? Cause they've never missed before. And when they miss, it's like, Oh my God, am I not getting stronger? Are these bad things happening? Or like, is this the right program? And like, you know, when we were doing the Shaco stuff, it's like, everybody's confident or 70 to 80% who's not Mm -hmm. but the second they'd have those tests I mean some people would have this like crippling anxiety and it's like what are you fucking scared of we're just lifting weights you know and like that's never been a a big problem for me being scared under the bigger weights so like it was something I never thought of before like I just trusted Shaco like he told me to put a weight Mm -hmm. on the bar I'll just put it on the bar but for like some of my lifters like they would get so nervous and then they go to meets and they fucking hate the experience all of a sudden I get them lifting heavier. They hate lifting heavier and then they like lifting heavier and then they're doing it too much. I'm like, yo, you need to fucking calm down. And then meets are now fun. Right. So like you got to get that mindset to go from being scared to having some fun and then learning how to turn it on. Um, so for me, I think in the beginning, and this is just the personal thing, a heavy set of five fucking sucks. Like, I, I'll do singles all day long. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't care. But a heavy set of five, like, by the third one, you're like, fuck. So, like, just doing, like, higher rep stuff like that, I think, just kind of, like, builds that. There's a, I don't know if mental toughness is the right word, but, like, there's this, like, men- mentality behind it. Um, and we'll work on, like, hey, well, what did you tell yourself? Like, how you're saying, you were saying a minute ago, like, well, what were you telling yourself under the bar? It's like, well, what were you telling yourself before? It's like, holy shit, I was really fucking nervous. Like, you know, and it's. I think everybody too, like beginners, they always want to just, they always want to be like, I wasn't scared. I'm not scared. And it's like, man, just acknowledge it. We all get a little fucking mm-hmm. scared. Like it's a big weight. We've never touched mm-hmm. it before. Like you unrack it. It feels so heavy in your back. You can't even take a breath. And it's like, that sucks. It's mm-hmm. scary, you know? So make sure you acknowledge like, Hey, this is scary. Um, back in the day, I saw this sports psychologist and he, I loved John Jones when he was coming up because he was just athletic and like did some stuff. And in an interview, we had talked about like before he would even put in his game plan, he'd sit there and he'd think of the worst things that could happen to him in that fight. Like you get knocked out in front of everybody, you get hurt, you get. And he goes, once I come to terms with that, then I put in my my game plan. And so like one of the things that I try to teach everybody is like you can't push it down because the more you push down those like nerves and that fear and all of that stuff the more it comes out in other ways, right? So you got to acknowledge it. You got to be okay with it. And you got to learn to accept it. And, and like that it. beginning and use it. And that beginning process is that, right? It's going from learning to accept it and learning how to take that and turn it into something positive. Um, so I think in terms of like building the technique and the mental aspects and the, I like showing them different things and like letting them have fun. And um, it's much more like top down in the beginning. And so we actually do this like reflection exercise. It's three, two, one journaling. So you, you write three things that went well, two things that could have gone better, and one thing you learned each training day. So when you reflect on those past experiences, you learn about it, you learn about it, you learn about it. Um, and then over time, like it just kind of becomes them learning what they need and putting those exercises in and, and making, it their, making it their own thing. So it's, all right, they, they don't know anything now. They, they need the right mental, physical, and tactical, right? Those, those weaknesses, they need the right stuff built. Where do we start and how do we kind of build that from there? Um, and I don't know, I'm always trying, trying different things and seeing, and seeing how it goes with it. So like a lot of my people started with Shaco, right? So they got a lot of technical practice. So we didn't really have to focus on that as much. So now when I get beginners, it's like, okay, well, this is, this is different than the group that I had before starting the conjugate stuff. Um, so, you know, we got to start in different places. So like this college powerlifting team, this Tufts powerlifting team, most of them, none of them have competed before. 
So like, okay, well, where do we start? What do I want them? And it's funny, like mm-hmm. the box squad, it does, it breaks it up. And it's like, I was having people sit on the, it's like, stop. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. and doing that same stuff. Um, you know, and like, how do we get them from here? Where are they now? And then how do we get them here? And then the next step and then the next step. So like, it's the lifter's job to think about present moment, like where I am in this moment, what I need to do in this present moment It's the coach that needs to be thinking about, okay, yeah, I'm a step ahead of you. You think about being here. I'm going to think about being here. And like we meet, we have these conversations and, and then we kind of, you know, figure out a, a game plan from there, if that makes sense. When we get into the intermediate, how often, how frequent does the exercise rotate? How, how often does it change? How long do you keep it in? It depends for the intermediate, but usually weekly by that point. Okay. Um, so it'll start in the beginning where it'll be one exercise. Cause like they just need practice like one, right? Let's take a box squat or an SSB box squat. So we actually, in the beginning, if, Let's say they're getting like cashewed over, mm-hmm. push the handles up, push it down in yeah. your back. And then over time, you just kind of gradually build up into it. Um, but they, what are they going to get out of a max effort exercise if they're, you know, turning into a cashew on the way up? Like, it doesn't fucking matter, right? Like, hey, good for you. You stuck with it. There's a mental piece to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of like, if your back does that under a straight bar, you're getting a fucking haircut. Like, that's just not working. So they need to, in order to get the most out of those exercises, right? Like when I talked about an elite lifter can take a new exercise and figure it out in that one day, right? It just takes them longer. Mm. So put it in, be a little bit more conservative. So you get a good technical rep. There's some strain to it. It's not a lot. You're teaching them how much weight they can handle, how much weight they can put on the bar. They're making these decisions. And then let's just get some rep practice. Let's just practice it. Just like Shaco would have you do. Rep, 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 rep. And then... Let's take that practice week three. Let's beat week one. But this also too, it's, it's smoke and mirrors in some way. Cause one, the whole point is five pounds better each time you go out. Right. Yeah. This is just like built in confidence, right? Cause you can't bullshit yourself, but guess what? If I set it up in a way that you're hitting a five pound PR in every exercise week three, you're building confidence doing that. But at some point you got to learn how to miss. And so what ends up happening is you'll have two types of people, the ones who are 40 pounds away, and the ones whose fucking eyes are bleeding week one. Mm-hmm. Well, you're putting five more pounds on week three. How are you going to do that? Right? So then they try to do it and they miss. Right? So then they learn how to miss and they learn their capabilities that way. And, and there's conversations that go with that. Like, hey, stop being a fucking idiot. Or they'll get to week two and it'll be so fucking heavy because week one was so heavy. Because we'll take that percentage of week two based off of week one. And they'll be like, wow, that was really hard to get through. And it's like, yeah, well, the recovery cost of maxing out eyes bleeding every week is a lot. Like... You guys are drug free. You guys have jobs. Like, I mean, we have a couple doctors on the team. We have people getting PhDs. We have, you know, and certain, and like everybody's stress capabilities, what they're capable of handling is just, it's limited. And so, you know, you're, you're trying to build that bucket at the same time too. And it's like, well, you're not going to max out the same way that maybe I can max out every single week or that, you know, Johnny over here is going to max out every single week. Like you got to find a way that actually fits with your recovery capabilities in terms of exercise. And then we'll figure out carryovers for it and all of this stuff. So, um, one of the things with like the max effort stuff, if you look at like the dynamo club, when they did it, what they, they had the 20 to 45 different exercises, but what they did is they had math and they had coefficients with how specific each exercise was. And each lifter had each coach had either one or two lifters, no more than that. So they're coming up with these, these graphs of this exercise is most specific, this is least specific for each individual lifter. And then what they would do is they would set up their long-term training plan in blocks the same way where it'd be less specific to more specific for the max effort work. So they're taking like, and there's probably something to like lower load, more variety in the max effort stuff earlier on, and it's building to something that's more specific later on. Right. So you're gradually building up like absolute loads at the same time, but obviously the general to to more specific, like it really fits into that like periodized model. And so you can take each lifter and it's like, okay, what do you need? Like, who cares if you're more than 12 weeks out from a meet? Like, do whatever the fuck. But like, if we're planning something, it's like, okay, I know I get something out of a front squat and it saves my back. Like, this is good deadlift carry over here for this exercise. All right. So on this deadlift day, instead of pulling a two inch max effort deficit. Let's hit a front squat to save your back a little bit. You're still getting the strain 
And then we'll do some barbell RDLs or snatch grip RDLs or something like that afterwards where you can build up those muscles that maybe we were kind of looking to hit in that max effort lift, right? So you can kind of like find a way based off of their carryover, their needs, their recovery capabilities, and it just builds itself out over time. But they have to learn how to do that because I'm not them. I don't know what they're like. Yeah. For me, if my lower back hurts, I'm probably just going to do what I'm not supposed to do anyways. I think the uh, teaching the ability to miss is a big thing, you know, for beginners. That way they don't end up being that asshole. Oh, that's yeah. the elite lifter that's tearing off all the spotters biceps because they just Drop bail under bar. a bar and they don't yeah. know what to do, which again becomes this interesting thing for me when, you know, <clears throat> coaches will talk about specificity, but yet in every other sport, the first thing an athlete learns how to do is fall, you know, but in our sport, they're always taught don't ever miss. Right. So the, you know, it, it just comes into play that they should earlier, right? Obviously, you don't want to teach an advanced lifter how to miss. You know, it's, the, the risk reward becomes way too high. With um, for for myself, the max effort stuff for me became more of a key indicator of where everything was than the application of it in itself. And so, to explain. My, my close grip incline would always be about 60% of what my raw bench was going to be or about what my raw bench would be. Two board press was 92%. Um, a three board press was like 96%. A floor press was somewhere in the like 88%. So I had all these. And then it, I started figuring the numbers out based upon my shirt where my carryover was to become bigger right. and you know different on the shirt. But what that allowed me to do, because the strength was really being developed in the supplemental movements, not so much in that max effort movement. That was a skill attribution of how to strain and all the other stuff. It let me know where I was. Like, okay, I'm 16 weeks out. This is way too far off where it should be from where, without having to actually test the main lifts all the time, which is one of the misconceptions, I think, of Westside back in the day is, you know, no, we didn't do the competition lifts a whole lot, but did we have to if we knew exactly what that correlation right. was between what we had and the skill attributes there and it's being reinforced with the dynamic work as well? You know, it kind of plays into that where if it's way off, it's like, oh, shit, like, why is this way off? All right. Oh, it's this needs to go in. You know, then this goes in, then that comes back up again. And but that also takes time. Right, because you can only rotate a max effort exercise in so frequently right. to be able to know if there is a correlation or not a correlation and all those other factors in there. But it's still an indicator, you know, that should have some people talk about specificity. I like to use the word correspondence, right? Because correspondence, yeah. like does this have dynamic correspondence to whatever is gonna happen, what you're training for, you know, the one max max on whatever it's gonna be, because that is more well rounded towards most things where specificity becomes very convoluted, you know, where correspondence, okay, does this make a difference? That transfer. Yeah. yeah. Is there a transfer? And then, you know, a lot of Ursuline and some of the other books, it was uh, maybe even Bonder check. It, it talked about dynamic correspondence, you know, basically carryover, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. just a technical word for a carryover, which I think that becomes a big part of the auto regulation process. You know, because as soon as the lifts, you start to see, hey, man, when this goes up, not even if it goes up, when this feels better, it could just be the same weight range, but damn, it feels easy. Then they know this is going to be easy. Yeah, it's a one. I guess one of the things that. Because also, too, like if you're rotating things in and out, right, so you'll have these exercises that. So like for me my if let's say i rotate out incline incline bench press i rotate it back in and it, it's lighter right than it was before as that gets stronger it may not even be back to my best numbers but it'll seem like as that's going up my bench feels better mm -hmm. right so maybe it's not necessarily that that has to get like over what i did before it's just going to be better than what it is now right because mm -hmm. we're not training the incline press we're training the bench press yeah um, I'm literally just thinking out loud. Um, There's a, for, for me, there was always a feel like this feels right. Yeah. Right. And, or, or this feels like shit. All right. This feels like shit because it sucks right now. And then it feels right, you know, and I don't necessarily have to throw the more weight on for what it's going to be. It just yeah. feels right. And then 
for me, the close grip incline always had a correspond. I'm not saying it does for everybody. It yeah. doesn't. But for me, it was probably the biggest indicator of where my bench was going to go. If I just jumped in that every now and again, even as a supplemental, and it sucked, it's like, fuck. Or actually, it was in reverse. My bench didn't feel right. Speed didn't feel right. Max effort stuff didn't feel right. Throw that in for a couple weeks as a supplemental. It's all back. Okay. Did I get stronger? No. Did I forget how to engage? Probably. Oh, maybe that's it. Right? So it just taught me how to re-engage the triceps to be able to push it through. Because weak points can also just be not really a muscular weak point, but they just aren't engaging. They don't know how to engage their lats. So it may not take fucking pendley rows. It may just take an exercise that's going to teach them how to flex their lats. And then it you know brings them through. I had a uh, situation where... I think one of the hardest things, right, when you're learning a conjugate program is when you're dealing with the weaknesses. You all of a sudden just want to focus on the weaknesses and you forget about everything else. So, uh, you know, I'm focused on triceps, triceps, triceps. And all of a sudden I'm dumping everything towards my hips. And I'm like, fuck. And then I'm like, man, maybe I should add in some more overhead work or Mm -hmm. some more delt work. And, you know, thinking back on what you just said, there's no way a fucking single arm dumbbell overhead presser seated is making a difference on my bench press. But once I added those in within a few weeks, boom, like my bench just, I stopped dumping it towards my hips. Yeah. It's probably that activation thing with the, um, so with your athletes, when you look at the supplemental, so we get off of the dynamic and the max effort. Now we get lower tier into the program. The um, it's obviously going to be different than when you were working with Boris and with Chico, yeah. right? Cause it's a bigger, it's a way bigger percentage. How do you go about that? So we just kind of do it in a standard way where our, so you get your max effort or dynamic effort will be the main exercise of that day. Yeah. And then you get your primary accessory exercise. So this will be a big compound movement, typically with a barbell or safety squat bar. We might use a camera bar actually for this. Um, Heavy three to eight. Um, There will be times where I will throw like a comp lift in as a primary Mm-hmm. So what I might do, let's say on a bench day, maybe I, I want to hit a uh, seated overhead press off pins just to get myself off a flat bench, save my pecs, whatever I'm trying to do. And then maybe there I might program some like comp bench reps. Um, but typically what I like to do personally is that primary accessory should be fucking heavy, three to eight, as heavy as you can go on that exercise. Um, and then we'll cater it down and we'll... Um, do higher rep stuff like later on. However, I think the, you know, if you want to call auto regulation energy management, because I think energy management is one of the more important things when you're lifting heavy or trying to lift fast all the time um, because they are higher intense training days. And if you could do it 52 years, uh, 52 weeks out of the year, you're getting all 200 plus high intense training days, right? So it's not physically possible to do. So there may be times where you have to take that primary accessory. Let's say it's a camera bar, good morning, heavy set of five or something. Instead of doing that, maybe we'll do belt squat, hip hinge, hold type stuff, Mm -hmm. right? Just to save the back a little bit. So they have to like learn how to kind of move it around and develop that training skill themselves so that they can manage their energy levels. But then that's a conversation like, dude, why can you never do the heavy compound movement next? Because that may be the most important part of the training, right? We got our sport, our sport training with the max effort work. We got our speed work in here. That primary accessory, that may be the, the mm-hmm. bread and butter of the training. Why can't you do it all the time? You know, so then it's like, okay, well, let's adjust our sleep. Let's whatever the, the next step mm-hmm. is. Um, and then for the rest of the accessories, I like them having fun, like pick some stuff, like here are the things I like. So I try to add in different things. Cause like we all get stuck in our own, mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. our own ways. Um, so then like, I think it can be a fun little like group thing too, where like somebody would be like, Hey, I tried this today. Like, um, you know, and just, just rotate that stuff around. But I think like the main stuff, it's like, Hey, here's your bread and butter. Here's the stuff we're trying to do. If you can't do a GHR, well fucking start doing GHRs until you can. Yeah. You know, um, one of my lifters, like he's a 700 pound squatter and he came into a fucking lunge. It's like, dude, just add these, add these in. Yeah. Like you're going to get these beginner gains, man. Like add these in. It's, you know, maybe yeah. it's the activation. Like, um, so like find the stuff that you suck at, and like, uh, you know, you said before, like, and just do more of it, yeah. um, in there. And I think that's even more important. Like, I think there's something to just 
the psychological piece of like doing something you suck at and getting better at it. There is. That's confidence. There's, there, there's a weird complicated piece that comes into the physical part too, because there, there's a chance they can't really push that supplemental exercise really hard because they're just not fucking in shape enough to do it. Yeah. Right. And that could be because every time they, they start to push and they feel that fatigue overtraining, whatever they want to call it, they always back down but they don't push through, mm. right? Where there's, your our body is very keen to adapting. You know, if it's, I'm not saying that the Bulgarians is right. What I'm saying is I could probably take somebody that's not the most genetically inclined and over a period of six years with consistency, rest and nutrition, get them to do that same workload. Now, is it necessary for the gains? Fuck no. <laughs> Right. But can the body adapt to that? Yes. So we we're in this weird age to where recovery matters. And I don't disagree with that, but is the recovery matters conversation happening to the detriment of people just being in fucking worse shape. Right. And because adaptation is a thing, we all know that, right. That's how the main lifts adapt, but the body as a whole organism has to adapt as well. And, you know, does that lead to overuse, joint injuries, all the other kind of stuff? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it does not having the integral structure of all the supportive tissues also lead, you know, to all those things. That's true. Yeah. So it's this balance, you know, to where I think that balance really becomes more a conversation of how high can that work? Let's just call it total work capacity how high can that total work capacity goes? And that, as you said, that the underlying question is, what is the lifestyle of the person you're working with? Do all they do is eat and play video games and don't have to worry about money? Then you could probably slowly increase that work capacity a little bit higher, you know? And um, Louie had some people that were kind of like that. So that work capacity could be increased much higher than somebody else that working 12 hours a day you know, and has all of these other life stresses, which is going to kind of change that work capacity Two entirely, you know, same strength level people two entirely different yeah. situations. And then you have them trained together, you know, and one's <laughs> like, man, you're a motherfucking pussy. You can't do this shit. You can't do that. You know? And it's like the other one's like, man, you're doing way too much. You shouldn't do that much. And <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's very, it's, it's so obvious to me why there's so many, difference of opinions and these conversations that go on it's it's right in front of us but we don't see it but as people that are coaches or advise or mentor if you see that whole organism you know person as that whole then it can be like dude come on man you don't do shit except train and you can't do your supplemental work like what the fuck maybe you need to push a little bit harder in the gym you know eat another meal but come on, you know, and then it's, it's a big variable. I think too, you know, like I said earlier, right? The best part of powerlifting your grandmother can do it. The worst yeah. part is your grandmother can do it, right? So everybody signs up and it's like, well, I want to be like this guy. It's like, well, that guy played professional football. You've done nothing. And so like people, they don't even know how to work hard, right? So like they don't even know where, that, where to put that effort in. So like if they're not having fun, right? Because fun in general decreases recovery cost. Like if you're having a good time, you're talking shit with your friends in the gym and doing your max effort lift, you're going to recover a lot easier than if you're just like, this fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to do this. So I think for a lot of people is like, they just, they have this limit to what effort they can actually put out. And like, there gets to be this, this, you know, the whole like challenge versus threaten like mindset, right? Where like you can give somebody an effort level that challenges them and it's going to push their, their level higher, but you give them a, an effort level that all of a sudden exceeds it by too much. And now it's a threat to their well being. Mm-hmm. And so in those cases there, that's just where like that burnout and those overtraining symptoms, I think come from. Cause it's like, man, you don't even work fucking hard enough to get overtrained. How you don't lift enough to get overtrained. Like where's this, Where's this coming from? So like, I think it's just going to be something like mental. So it's like teaching them one. And that's why it's at the bottom of my pyramid. Like effort's more important than technique. Like you're going to learn how to work hard. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't know how to push yourself and like stress those limits and be uncomfortable, you're never even going to get to that point Mm -hmm. in the first place. And I think it's more of a psychological 
piece for a lot of beginners coming in. Like, you know, I think of the guys who are going to West Side, like that probably wasn't an issue, right? No. Like you're probably not getting guys that aren't serious, that have never done anything before, that have never pushed themselves. There, um, there's some kind, <coughs> rarely, let me just say very, very rarely, but it was there, right? Where GPP was a big component though. So it's, yeah. I don't, I, I actually don't like those three letters, just conditioning. Because you can get a super strong person, but if his circulatory system can't process the nutrients and recover, it doesn't matter how fucking strong right. they are, there's a problem. And if all they needed to do, I mean, this is before like 10 minute walks were popular. Like all they needed to do is walk on a fucking treadmill a few times, <laughs> you know, just get this moving a little bit to where it shouldn't be a pain in the ass to walk across the room, even though I used to brag about how cool it was to be a pain in the ass, but it's not. You know, because if that's a problem, then how the fuck do you think you're going to recover from this to this? And um, so it's Louis was good about finding ways to keep us in shape for what we were doing, you know, without us really knowing that's what was going on. Yeah. Like sled would be one thing like fucking stupid sled. You know, and there was, <laughs> it was that and, and not everybody did. You know, so if it wasn't that, then all of a sudden it was the, the, the training density was there for a reason. Right. So he'll talk about, you know, in the writings for the growth hormone and it's probably all bullshit. Right. It's I think the biggest reason for the training density the way it was, was you couldn't sit down. You had to move. You had to keep going because that was part of the conditioning process. You know, so if it dynamic squad day, ain't fucking nobody ever sitting down. At least not when I was there. You sat down, you were getting a knee wrap or something was getting thrown at your head or you were, you were being ridiculed. And then you know, it was nonstop. As soon as you st now we'd fuck around for a while, but as soon as you started, it didn't stop until you left. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that in principle, right? Because there's a community aspect that I think can happen with group training that can get lost in that type of high density type of training where it's just in out. But as that density opens, you know, and becomes easier, the volume probably needs to go up. The conditioning needs to come in somewhere to be able to balance that out. It's funny you say that, but not, like one of the things I always try to do on max effort days, and I try to encourage this to the lifters too, is don't sit down, mm -hmm. stand up. Like it's just going to get you in better shape because when you're at a meet and you're sitting down in between each one, like it's going to feel like nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, um, you know, the GPP stuff or the work capacity, like conditioning stuff, it was the hardest stuff for me to wrap my head around in terms of going from a Shaco program to a conjugate program. Cause obviously it's flipped right in mm -hmm. terms of like the volume. It's like, man, I don't know. Like how, how is, how is a dumbbell overhead press going to make my bench press? Like it's hundreds of pounds different. Like I don't, mm -hmm. how's it going to make it any better? And so, um, it was actually, and this is actually why I wanted to go out to West side, meet Louie, hang out with him. And like, I, I mean, I talked to him on the phone and it was like an hour and a half and I ended up being like 30 minutes late for something. Cause I'm like, do I tell Louis Simmons that I got to fucking mm -hmm. go or do I just like, and so like, I'm asking these questions and he's like, well, how'd you deadlift? the first time without ever deadlifting. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, that makes a lot of sense. And then like I started, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I went there and I saw how they were doing their accessories. And I'm like, here's the problem, right? Like with the Shaco program, I, I used so much energy, like squat bench and going back to squat fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to those two or three exercises, I'm just going through the motions. I might as well have probably not been doing them mm -hmm. in hindsight, but maybe it's blood flow to the area or whatever. And so I'm like, wow, these guys are like really getting after these accessories. This is not what we were doing at all. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm just going to fucking do it. I'm going to push the accessories. And so I started pushing the accessories and all of a sudden like, all right, well, I'm spending less energy on my main lifts now, more energy on this stuff. Maybe the energy I'll put at the end of the training day is the same, but I'm feeling better. My lifts are, are coming together better. And it was just, it's one of those that I don't know, no matter how many times somebody tells you like, Hey, do more GPP work until you experience it. I don't think you're gonna you're gonna actually uh, stick with it. I just because it just like logically, I think it just does not make sense. Like, how's dragging this fucking sled gonna make me yeah squat more? You know. But then when you are recovering faster, and then I think where people miss the mark is 
like, and this is where I try to bring it in with my lifters. It's like, well, why do you have to deload every fourth week? Why do you have to drag the sled that day instead of doing max effort work like everybody else? Probably because you're not dragging the fucking sled enough, which is why yeah. you're doing it on your deload, you know? Um, so like that recovery process of um, just being able to get those more higher intense training days throughout the course of the year. Um, I don't know. It just, it, it makes a, a huge difference for sure. Well, and when I look at you know, the broad view of high frequency training, which is essentially Chico and, you know, all the, the various high frequency programs and then the low frequency. So you could say conjugates in there. You could say linears in there. You can put all these in there and say those are just the two different worlds. The, 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 the energy cost is when, when people move from one to the other, where they fuck up, right, is they try to move from a high frequency to a low frequency, but then they don't make up the difference yeah. with the accessories. Or they'll move from uh, uh, the vice versa. Then they'll go from, this probably happens more so than the other. So they'll go from a lower frequency to a high frequency, but then try to keep in all that stuff. And then wonder why in the fuck they're going nowhere. I'm like, dude, you can't do you can't squat three fucking times a week sometimes six you know because it would be doubled up in the same session sometimes you can't do that and then expect the fuck you're going to do lap pull downs and all this other shit you just right. can't you know that's why they're fucking different you know it's one of the biggest things with that and it's actually from from my broad view looking in it is the number one biggest mistake um because uh, on the going back to the original part, when they go from the high frequency to the low, they become fucking lazy as fuck. So they go from doing a high work capacity type training session to just doing the main lift, maybe a couple sets, you know, couple work sets. That's it. Nothing else. They like, say so now their total training density, well, tra training volume tonnage. Down. is oh it's way it's mm -hmm. fucking way down especially if you want to take the time to add in all the accessories which is a motherfucker to add in but if you did it's down 80 percent and then they initially get this huge pop like holy shit this is awesome it's like yeah it's like peeking for a meat you <laughs> dumbass <Yeah. laughs> so true you know, i've only been doing this four weeks and all my lifts are fucking killing it right now I'm like yeah okay wait another four can't figure out i suck i need to go back to the original thing i used to do and there they go in that cycle yeah i think one of the this is what i said to my lifters sometimes and like one of i think like a hidden gem part of a conjugate program is the accountability piece i think when you're doing a higher frequency comp lift program you're outsourcing your effort you're telling a coach like hey 70 percent five sets of three then you're going to do this they're giving you your effort for the day where like if I tell you, hey, you're going to take a heavy single on this, but the rest of your day, 95% of your training day, you're accountable for your own effort. And are you pushing this stuff? Are you doing the, like we have like a little like, you know, like one to two hard sets of each one where you're lifting as much weight as you can, where it doesn't look like a, like fucking ridiculous by the end of it. But are you doing those one to two hard sets of every one? And then, you know, once you are accountable from there and then it's like, okay, we'll add another set of this. Like, all right, this is a weakness. Do two to three of this one. Don't add in an exercise, other exercise and forget about this one. But you're accountable for your own effort and bringing up your own weaknesses. But like for me now, like what ends up happening is if somebody leaves, they'll go do a higher frequency program. It's like, wow, this is way better. It's like, because you're skipping all your accessories, motherfucker. Of course it is. Yeah. You're literally doing way more fucking work. And at the end of the day, you went from doing something very general to something very specific. That's just periodization. You just did it because you're just lazy and you had somebody mm -hmm. else organize it for you. But at some point, you're going to have to come back and address these things. Like, mm -hmm. it always comes back around. But, like, I think I think that cycle that you mentioned, I think that's why people leave the sport. It just becomes this, like, very hard. It's a merry-go-round, right? And at some point, like, you just get fucking sick of going in circles, so you're going to yeah. get off the merry-go-round. Well, it's, <laughs> it's supposed to get hard, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Life exactly. is fucking hard. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just it's just, it's a microcosm of fucking life. It's just yeah. the way it is. That's the whole point of the whole thing is to try to figure out how to operate and maneuver and live in hard and then how to figure <laughs> out, you know, how to figure it out, you know, so it's hard. How do you figure it out so it's not as hard? You know, it still stays fucking hard. It should. 
Yeah. You know, if you want soft all the time, I don't, I don't even know what the hell in life is all soft. So true. Right. So there, there's, there's nothing, you know, so it's, it's a weird thing. Um, one of the other topics we had down here was the um, accommodating resistance in bands where you said you've had people ask you and there's confusion on your, how you are incorporating the bands or just in general. I think just in general, I think, I don't understand. I don't know. Like it, you get this like argument that like, it's the same thing. It's just all or nothing. Right. So like bands are no good. And it's like, well, these research studies show and it's like, well, one, they're using like 10 percent band tension on there. God knows how they're setting it up. And I don't care how Johnny fuck nuts who squats 200 pounds uses bands. Right. So like there's just especially in like the USAPL IPF world, like bands are just like you don't use bands on it. But it's like you guys are using submaximal weights all the time. And you understand this deceleration that happens once leverages improve. Right. Like that's just you can't accelerate through. It's physiologically impossible. And so, like, I, I think the biggest like misconception of is if you want to do speed work, you have to use bands. And if you don't have access to bands, then maybe it's best if you adjust. Right. Use straight weight within those percentages. But now that's just rep work. Right. That's that's submaximal rep work at that point. So, like, just schedule that in your training, program it in your training accordingly. Um, but I think what people don't understand is I, I think it's this bands overload the top. And yes, there's a part of it, but you got to think of the experience of the bands, right? So if you've never unlocked a, unracked a squat bar with heavy bands at the top, you don't know how much that fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's 600 pounds at the top. It feels like more than 600 pounds straight weight because it is pulling you down. So there is some, there is a proprioceptive starting point of that there where your body's receiving those forces and it's interpreting as, oh shit, there's a lot of fucking weight on my back right here to do a movement I typically do frequently. And then as you're going down, so the whole kinetic energy thing, right? So like when plyometrics, no athlete would argue that they're not going to use plyometrics in their training. It's to increase kinetic energy. The actual equation for it is one half mass times velocity squared. So the faster you go down, the more you're going to get out of the more kinetic energy you get. And when we talk about energy management, your passive stretch reflex, it's free energy. If your body gets that elastic rebound at the bottom, right? So if I have a rubber band, and I pull it back and I let it go, that's kinetic energy that's going to send it flying. But if I pull it back and I let it go slowly, it's just going to fall to the floor, right? Kinetic energy is free energy. Learn how to use it, and it adds to your already, your already developed strength. So it is in addition to what you already have. So if that elastic rebound can carry it up and then your muscle properties take over, you're going to, one, spend less energy and be able to move more weight. To me, that's just, that's a gimme. Um, so coming down, if you're actually using the bands, and of course, if you put, you know, heavy bands on a beginner who's never squatted with bands before and they're moving down at half the speed that they typically would, that's fucking useless. Like it's going to match the capabilities of the lifter, which probably takes time to develop. But if you can come down faster, you can increase that kinetic energy, you it's that same thing. You're going to develop greater stretch reflex out of the bottom. And it's, it's a neurological adaptation from the bottom. It's the same with the box squat. It's a weighted plyometric. It is an accessory to your squat training. Like the argument would be like, don't use box squats because it's not your comp squat. Cause the box isn't there during a comp, during a comp lift and a hundred percent use your comp stance because we're trying to develop explosiveness in your comp stance. But when you hit that box, like that whole, uh, what did Louis say with the basketball, right? The deformation piece, right? The more you slam it down. Well, that's happening. Your hamstrings, your foot when you're sprinting has a collision with the ground, right? When you're jumping has a collision with the ground. And so the box just creates that collision. So you're just developing this neurological adaptation to be a little bit more explosive out of the bottom. That's all you're looking to do with it. Right. It's not in like the argument of, oh, it's not a comp squad. It's not a it's not this. It, you don't need to overload the top as a um, raw lifter. It's like, have you ever put gear on? You can start oh, moving yeah. that shit fucking fast from the bottom. Yeah. Like it, it's fucking heavy at so, the bottom. Yeah. So that's where I go back to the definition of what is a comp squat. Right, because before you before somebody's going to tell me it's not a comp squat, I want to know what they define a comp squat as. That's a good question. Right, because if we're going if we're allowed to work within certain standard deviations of that by taking the walkout out, by not having a squat command, yeah, yeah. by not having judges, exactly how many deviations <laughs> are we allowed to work from without that? 
and what's acceptable because if you're acceptable with one standard deviation away or two then why why not three like exactly how many standard deviations become not that comp squat right. or are we not talking about developing a squat pot squat we're talking about developing you know explosive force right so the other the other interesting and you already said it in in your own way but the what I've come back with the bands on is okay. Let me just I, I like to like to say there because there's multiple reasons for things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just concede the fact that you're right. It doesn't work. And um, by the way, I guess we got to discount every study that's ever been done on a cam that's been on a Nautilus machine or any other machine because all those cams do is to accommodate the strength curve, which is why they are on the machines. So all those don't count. But I did train Gen Pop for a long fucking time. A long time, and after I would teach them how to squat with a broomstick, the first thing that I did was put a light band, not heavy, like a mini band, yeah. on the bar, just so grandma, right, <laughs> would learn how to get tight before they sat down, because one of the hardest things to teach them was how to get tight. You know, without that, I'm trying to like push on their stomach and move them, and you know, don't let me move you, and all this other kind of stuff. I put a band on there, bam, they're tight. They're not going anywhere because it reinforces that neural connection. Oh shit, if I don't do this, I'm moving all over the place. The other thing that was really, really hard to teach, not so much grandma, but athletes, is how to stand up with force. Yeah. Put a band on there, they sit down and they just try to stand up as they normally would. They go, I'm like, oh shit, maybe I need to go boom. <laughs> like, oh shit, look, we just taught two things like that that need to now be verbally reinforced you know, for what that is. So the pushback on that is, so that's bad? Like, that's not a good thing? Like, we should just go back to teaching this in a non-optimal way so they can't really, like, tactical cueing is bad. You know, and again, it's contextual. Like, yeah. what is, why it's there? So it's, maybe it's not just there for that. Maybe it's there for these other things. Now I can go down a big rabbit hole here and say now with super high band tension, yes, it's like you just gave yourself two more legs. So now you got more stability. Yeah, yeah. So you take them off, now you're fucked. You know, so there has to be that time there. And then I have my my own anecdotal, you know, is I trained on West Side for three years doing speed work before we even had fucking bands. <laughs> then we had chains for a year first, you know, and then then the bands came in after that, you know, and I went with Louie to pick the bands up from the fucking basketball clinic and came back like, what the fuck are we going to do with these things? We're going to put them <laughs> on the barley like chains. Like, oh, fuck. Then there was whole, you know, like how to put them, you know, and then went through this big curve of going from not a whole lot of tension to like fucking outrageous tension. So there's a whole, you know, process on there where am I to just discount all the gains that I made before right. having the bands? Because my squat went up a hundred and some pounds. So speed work don't work without bands and chains that's bullshit too right because you know it, it did because of there's multiple factors why it was put in mm -hmm. there um and then there's reasons you know it's it's everything's got multiple reasons you know again yeah. with that um and i remember because i used to get the nsca journal at the time i don't follow the research any i just read the mass research summary yeah. now so that's about as far as i follow that but back then i was following it a lot and it was there's nothing on bands, nothing on bands. Then it was, you know, then there started to come research studies like, holy shit, this has a positive, bands have a positive impact. And of course, I'm using my biased opinion to justify everything <laughs> I'm fucking seeing that's even, even yeah. remotely like this worked in a rat. They got more explosive. This has to work with, you know. So I'm on the other end of that whole bias scale. And so there would be positive stuff that would come out. And I would discount the fact of whatever the population was and all the other things that can go different with that. And then I quit doing it. And now I guess the research is going the other way, you know, with that. And it will come back to the other way. But whatever it is, when I look into it or I ask people that watch it, I fall back to say, did they study the ability for the lifter to get tight at the start of the lift? Because how you start the lift is how you finish the lift. Was that part of this? Well, no, they're just studying, okay, so you're taking a big part of this out. There's, again, there's more things that go on. And um, so it's, and then the coach's ability to not be a fucking idiot too. And also too, like with the studies, it's, well, are they doing the max effort method with it? Are they doing accessory work? Like, um, 
Well, I don't the, think they can. That's not what they're looking exactly. for. Exactly. It's done in a vacuum, right? Yeah. So like the practical application of this stuff is always going to be changing. It's it's why Shaco's program worked for his people and worked to a certain point with mine. If I ran conjugate the same exact way that Louie did, it worked well for West Side. It's not going to work as well for the group of people I have. It's it's where that like understanding those um where those methods fall in line and how to practically apply it for the individual that's that's sitting in front yeah. of you that that's what coaching is yeah now yeah. i'm not anti my, my volume just went through the roof for some reason in my headphones i'm not anti-science in any way i i love like the master research review and all the other kind of stuff because it for it gives a starting spot yeah. right so let's say the consensus is bands aren't doing what they're supposed to do fine cool i'm good with that most people probably shouldn't fucking start with it anyhow just learn how to do the basic lifts, you know, and learn the basic structure of how to progress a lift over time. In other words, let's just reduce the noise a little bit so they can focus on what's really most important because maybe that is something that's creating too much noise for somebody that's coming into the sport to begin with. Because imagine if you came in today instead, oh fuck, if I came in today instead of 30 years ago, like what the fuck? That's true. What the fuck? Now, like, I, what what program, what modality? If I'm even smart enough to know that there's different modalities, it's like, what program? There's 80 programs. Like, what, yeah. fuck, what, what shoes am I supposed to wear? It's a question, right? <laughs> Where do I lift? I mean, look at all the, you put yourself in the place of somebody that's coming in that isn't in this field. You're, you're, kid, you're, you're younger athletes. Yep. They don't know any of that. They don't know anything. And then... They're going to say, it's like, we got to reduce that noise, man. Mm -hmm. You know, just here's this, you know, let's find a way to just ride the newbie gains, you know, teach us some critical things like eat right, sleep, you know, yeah, show exactly. up, be consistent. The first time. So I had been lifting for probably four years at least. And the first time I decided to put bands on the bar, I threw a pair of average bands on there. I got halfway up in that concentric. And my air, I just, went, poof. Mm -hmm. like all my air just got punched out of me. I mean, I stood up with it, but like I was rounded over. I was like, holy shit. Like you could just see how I had developed just like, cause you know, in the bottom you got that acceleration, but then that deceleration that happens, I just did straight weight all the time. So like, that's just where I ended up. Mm -hmm. And like, I couldn't imagine like taking a beginner and just throwing them like no, there's something crazy. crazy like that. My, yeah. my headphones are still really loud. I went mm. test, 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 test. That's better. Okay. Um, <clears throat> were there, I didn't even look at this. Were there any other topics that you wanted to talk about that we didn't go into? Um, so I think we covered basically, um, everything. I think the transition though, from like the Shaco to the conjugate, I just, I think it's a really important topic just because like I, I went from doing one thing and doing something completely, what seems like completely like inversed and like how to get there. Like, I think if you're a coach and you just pay attention, right. And like, like everybody wants to kind of jump on a certain bandwagon of a, a programming style or something like it probably meets some personality needs of the coach, whatever. Um, but like, like I said, like that first lifter, it's like, well, Shaco's all about technique, but I'm trying to use this and the technique's not getting better, right? That's the same lifter. She, now as a 125 pound lifter, she had squatted 305 in the gym. Um, but in the beginning, two plates just scared her. Like she just became a different lifter. All of a sudden she's putting her wrist wraps on like a fucking psychopath. And it's like, what's going on here? Right. And like she would just miss all the time. And it's like, I, you're capable of lifting this. And it's and then I have the other lifters who are just so nervous going into the tests. Right. And like your job as a coach, do you want to be better? Or do you want to be fucking right? Like if you want to be better and you want to truly and you care about the person sitting in front of you, and you want to truly help them. Well, fucking help them by paying attention. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, OK, well, I don't know how to do you fix their nerves. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'll just make them lift heavy more. And so we went through this whole process of. um like daily maxis when that was a thing, right? We tried out that stuff and it's like, well, this works up to a certain point, um, you know? And then it's like, okay, well, as I've gotten older and I've gotten stronger people on the team or the people that I've had, like there's some people who've been on my team for well over five years now. When you 
at some point it's hard to make fucking progress, especially with these people. So like having that relationship is important, but it's coming into like, okay, well we got to try different things. We got to try different things. And then like, it's funny. Cause like I have a master's degree. I started by reading research and now like I had a friend, he copied over all the old powerlifting USAs he had and you're reading articles in there and there's like hidden gems. It's like, some of these lifters from back then, they just, they figured it the fuck out. Mm-hmm. You don't need the science stuff. So let, let's try these things. Let's, and like, you just realize like, that's where the fun is. And there can be like this group effort of that. Like, Hey, I saw this. Can I try this? Can I do this? Can I? And I think eventually what you end up doing is you end up having like, of course your past experiences are going to matter. They're going to, there's going to be an accumulation of them. Right. So there's, there's aspects of Shaco's program within our programs. There's aspects of how, west side ran conjugate in our programs um you know and one of the things that I, I actually really like about the conjugate program is everybody does it a little bit differently like everybody's like oh so it's like okay well how do we put these pieces together so like free squatting i always box squat on dynamic effort day but i make sure i have one heavy straight weight free squat per month in my max effort lifts so i don't get too far removed from it that works for me mm-hmm. but other lifters still on their dynamic effort day are not using boxes and like, I mean, every part of me wants to be like, just do what mm, I fucking mm. do because it should be right. But if you're paying attention, you just kind of let them like carve out their own path. That's your job as a coach, right? And that's where the difference of like AI and coaching comes from, right? Like they're going to tell you to do something like, hey, I'm going to help guide you to figure to figure this shit out and hopefully not inflict too much of my uh, my bias on top of mm-hmm. that whole thing. You know? well, I think the bias leads into that, though, because it's the, the coaching should have some of your own bias yeah. because but your bias should have a lot of experience in different disciplines or at least study in different disciplines to be able yeah. to know because that's what's going to compete against the ai type crap that's going to come down the line yeah. and you, your your ability to see what's going on which yeah. is going to be in real time which is going to be another thing and because it's the what, what's coming down the line will replace you know most online coaches yeah. in a heartbeat especially the ones that are just copy and pasting they're going to be fucking done probably within the year, you know, but they, they're, they're done, you know, but outside of that, the coaching is different than programming, vastly different, yeah. you know, and the, the programming can be actually, you know, the future of that. Cause I hear both sides, you know, like, Oh, this is going to fuck it all up. It could be really, I mean, if, if the programming can be outsourced to the AI type stuff, that's actually AI that's really learning based upon the metrics that you can feed into that, man, that offloads a lot of shit for you to focus on the interpersonal side and the the, the part that that can't, which could the outcome, the the, the biggest thing is who's, who's it that who's the end user? Like who's the end customer, right? They benefit, you know, especially because if all that's like I said, outsourced where it's like, Oh shit, this here, this, this would be the perfect program based upon all the metrics for the day, but it needs these modifications, but that's better than something that's already imperfect from the start that needs the modifications. I think the one thing about AI that it, it, it just doesn't understand about momentum or like human needs, right? Like there's, there's days where it could just be like, man, I'm having a bad day. I know I probably shouldn't push this max effort lift, but I'm gonna fucking do it. I'm gonna huff a fucking cap and I'm just gonna fucking do it. Right. It might be just something I need to do that day. Right. Or like just gaining momentum. Like, you know, I think another big part of conjugate is like you got to play these like Jedi mind tricks with yourself where you can kind of always convince yourself you're getting stronger. And we know strength's not linear. Right. Do something you haven't done in a while and just get momentum rolling. Do something you've never done before and convince yourself you're stronger than what you are. Like, I think that stuff's really important. But during COVID, so I did all uh, in-person coaching. I had very few online before COVID. And then COVID hit and everything shut down. And it's like this moment where you can take a fucking breath. And it's like, all right, what's my job as a coach? What do sports mean to me? What am I doing here? Right? So like if you read like John Wooden's book, like he's got this pyramid of success, mm-hmm. he called it. I call mine the pyramid of greatness. And the only reason was I was watching Parks and Rec and Ron Swanson as a pyramid of greatness. I was like, that's a fucking <laughs> But it's like, okay, what is coaching and what do we, you know, for me, like sports has always just been this like really big, 
outlet. Like it got me out of an abusive home as a kid. It got me into college. It got me out of a, a huge hole later on in life. Um, and these are the lessons that I want to teach. So we're going to make those the foundation of that pyramid. So it's all just interpersonal stuff, right? Be self-aware. Your core values have that stuff. Learn, learn a little bit of resiliency. Learn how to work hard. Because the other stuff, who gives a shit what your squat technique looks like if you're a fucking dickhead in real mm -hmm. life, right? Or, yeah, you can have great technique, but if you don't know how to put max effort behind a, a weight or you don't know how to come back from being hurt, like developing that resi resiliency, who cares? And at the end of the day, like, if you're only strong on that, on that platform, like, and you step off that and you're just some piece of shit, like, who fucking cares? Mm -hmm. Like, what is this sport doing for you? Like, awesome, you can bench press more than me. Great. But, like, at the end of the day, like, are we developing those skills that are going to allow somebody to advance in their careers, pass these tests, do the, like, when it's like, man, you know, I went three years without a PR and finally hit a, hit a PR. Like, there's just some life shit that happens in there that just, like, carries on. And, like, uh, you know, I, I would like to see, like, the coaching aspect of, I know it's a, a small niche sport in its own corner of the fucking universe, but, like, Man, it's fucking hard, and it can be scary, and there's not a lot of sports that offer the same things, like a men's rec league basketball league or something. That's not giving me the same outlet that lifting is going to give me, right? So, like, I think just – I think people would stick with that sport more, too, if they just, like, focus on those – like, the, the whole process-oriented. I hate these, like – you get these like motivational quotes out there and it's like, man, everybody in some hard fucking times aren't staring at just do it on a fucking Nike mm -hmm. slogan. Right. And it's like these quotes that you're fucking sharing on the internet. That's, that's the end of the road. You're not learning from them how they got to that point of saying that quote, right? Like focus on that fucking journey, your own journey, be in the present moment, moment, you know, each step of the way, like use that stuff and just, and just build your character. And, like, I think if more people focused on that more than, like, oh, well, I only added five pounds to my lift or I didn't add anything to it, I'm going to quit. Like, it's when you want to quit and you stick with it that, like, those true learning things, like, happen. So mm -hmm. I hope people take that away and one person just decides to do that. Yeah. You know? No, that's that's a good takeaway. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what it all comes back to because I can, even, I can even flip that back to the training perspective and say – if that's true and that's the case, you're going to produce less cortisol. You're going to be able to recover better and you're going to become a better lifter. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it all kind of plays into the whole thing. Um, how can people go about finding you? So Instagram is prob probably the easiest. So it's KWCAN. Uh, our team is Precision Power Lifting Systems. There's with a C, not a K. With a C, not a K. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on Facebook, but I don't use it for that. But Instagram, I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Twitter. That's about all I can handle with social okay. media. But all right, we got all the links in the description. You know, I want to thank you for coming out. It's been Thanks great talking me. to you. Thank you guys, and we are done. Today's episode is brought to you by First Detachment. Are you looking for a supplement brand that truly understands hardworking athletes? Look no further than First Detachment. Wendy's real world experience is what I would consider and they consider battle tested. I have known Justin Harris for pretty close to two decades. And if there's anybody that I trust with nutritional and supplement needs, it's Justin Harris. If you guys have followed me and have followed the podcast, you pretty much already know how I feel about the supplement industry. For me to get behind any brand, I have to trust the brand and I have to trust the person both. And I'm pretty sure you guys all know why. When it comes to creating formulas and putting products on the market, and there's nobody that I trust more than Justin Harris. While I love all of their products, I'd suggest that you check out the Field Rations and WTH first. Go to www.firstdetachment.com and use the code TABLETALK10 to save 10% off each order. The link is in the description. Fumeric Health is a premium telehealth platform specializing in hormone optimization and preventative medicine. Are you looking to optimize your health in and out of the gym, improve recovery, sex drive, and quality of life? Have you tried speaking to your health professional about this and have gotten the cold shoulder, 
stereotyped or just told as part of getting older. You just go to americhealth.com backslash table talk and you can create your own lab or you can take labs that we've had set up for them which are based upon the same labs that I've been doing over the last 15 years. Or you can use their guided optimization. With this, they'll put you in touch with a patient care coordinator, which is actually pretty cool because you get to sit down and speak to somebody that can understand what you're looking for from hormone optimization and the preventive and medicine standpoint. After that conversation, they'll determine which labs that you should and which tests you should have done. And then from there, get the labs done. They'll review those labs with with you and put you in touch with one of their hormone optimization specialists that can determine which supplementation that you should use over the counter or prescription. AmericHealth.com backslash table talk. The discount code is table talk.